Oh, we didn't show these guys how to see the chat. That's fine. They'll figure it out. Or they won't. It doesn't matter. You guys open the actual YouTube link video in a separate window, which you won't do on your phones, so probably never mind. You want me to do that? Is that what you just said? That? You want me to open it in a separate window? Is that what you just said? Something like that. Yeah, you could. Okay, so I think we're live here, guys. Um... I guess I'll do introductions. Most people here probably know me. I'm the, uh, not necessarily the musky mind, but the quote unquote mastermind of Uncut Angling Aaron Weeb. And this is not about me today. This is about musky fishing, which I don't know very much about, which is why we brought in the big guns. And we've got a few different pro musky guides that guide in and around Lake of the Woods and are all fishing on Lake of the Woods tomorrow for opening day. We've got Darcy Cox from Tanks Industries. Say hi. What's going on, everybody? Darcy is going to be fishing on the north end of Lake of the Woods, and he is a guide based out of Kenora, so he is full-time on Lake of the Woods and I guess a little bit on surrounding lakes. You got it. You can track him down at Tank Industries. I will put links to these people in the description. If they don't show up there right away, you can come back and look for them in, uh, you know, an hour after this is done or else in the coming days because it will be all online for the eternity. Also, we got uh, with uh, Crazy Mustache. It looks like he's from Super Troopers. That's Joseph Cooper. Also based on Lake of the Woods. Um, Joseph guides not necessarily specifically for musky, but that is your choice, right, Joseph? Well, I, that is uh, the but I uh, do a little bit of everything walleye, crappie, bass, shore lunch. Shore lunch. Nice. And primarily musky. And Joseph's based out of the west end of the lake, around the northwest angle. And then completing the circuit of the lake, we've got Luke Ronestrand visiting Northwestern Ontario from down in lovely Minnesota, which we have great care for because I think probably the majority of the Uncut Angling fan base is in and around Minnesota, Minneapolis, Twin Cities, up and down Minnesota. And Luke guides primarily on Vermilion Lake, which everyone here is going to know of if you're from Minnesota. And he also does uh, musky fishing trips. Primarily on Vermilion Lake, which everyone Ooh, that's gonna be here confusing. is going to know of if you're from Minnesota. And he also does... Are you guys good right now? Yeah. Um, uh, people on the side were saying that there's no feed and stuff like that. I don't know if that's a, a deal. I bet you it's... it's up now. But, or, let me know, Darth. Mine live. It says we're live right now. Mine says we're live. Oh, geez. Okay. My apologies to anyone that has been watching, and we're going to start this all over again. We'll expedite it, but welcome to the first Musky Minds. Uh, we're calling it a podcast, even though we all know it isn't a true podcast. Um, we have got myself, Aaron Weeb, host of Uncut Angling, which I guess I'll be kind of like the moderator of this, and then I will be relying on some expert, true expert, professional Musky guides to be weighing in on some hot topics. And of those that we have present with us today is, first, Darcy Cox. Wave your hand, Darcy, there. Say, say hi. Hi, everybody. There's Darcy. Darcy uh, owns Tank Industries Guide Service based out of Kenora on the north end of Lake of the Woods. And he fishes muskies all season long out of there and also surrounding lakes somewhat. Darcy is going to be on Lake of the Woods tomorrow, uh, just like everyone here except for me. And he's going to be probably, I don't know, what end of the lake are you going to be on, Darcy? Uh, North and Central. North and Central. And then moving along, we've got, um, is it Farva from Super Troopers? I'm not super familiar with that film. <laughs> uh, a liter of cola here. <laughs> for, for, you know, there's only one mustache. That's Joe Cooper mustache. Farva is. But he's not a musky guy at the Northwest Angle, so... That's hey Joe. Joe, I'm gonna finish doing your intro. I think you should try and get as close to wherever you perceive your Wi-Fi originates from in your residence, even if it's a crummy hot area that you don't have the nice breeze off of the lake at, because you're the one that's dropping, I think, here. Uh Joseph Cooper lives in the northwest angle on Lake of the Woods, which is the uh west side. 
and he guides for all sorts of different species year round, every month of the entire year. And I believe his his favorite is musky and cooking shore lunch, which hopefully doesn't consist of musky too often. And Joseph also is going to be on the lake tomorrow guiding, and he will be guiding close to the ice, some surmise like the West End. So there, there's that side, and then if you complete the circle of Lake of the Woods, we go all the way around to the east side, and representing the amazing state of Minnesota, we have Iconic Musky Guide on location, doing some fun fishing with uh, some friends, and that is Luke Ronestrand, who makes his home and career guiding on Lake Vermilion. And in his holidays, he also goes musky fishing. Say hi, Luke. Hi, hi Aaron. Did Luke say hi? Hi, hi. Um, Luke is going to, like I said, he's going to be on the east side. So, like, all in all, we've got the whole lake that's going to be covered tomorrow. And up until now, the musky season has been closed. And I, I kind of feel like when the fishing season's closed, it sucks in a way. And uh, it keeps us off of the muskies, but I also feel like it sort of hypes us up for it. And there's like the anticipation of the season closing at the end of the year, the anticipation of it opening, and it and <laughs> we're good, we're good, we're good. <laughs> set up, we're good. I like the lake map in the background. That's going to be some good reference. Unfortunately, it looks like it might not be Lake of the Woods. That'd be Dryberry. How's the connection now, Aaron? Is it a little bit better? I'm about as close as I can get. Way better. Guys, is way Joe better? Cooper way Looking better? Out, it's not choppy. Everything's good? Looking way better to me. All right. Good. All right. There we go. This is I'm good. Right. Do I'm you right. want to give another close-up of your mustache and a little bit of background on it just so that it's definitely fully captured as opposed to last time when viewers might not have gotten to take it in? We're about, we're about seven or eight days in now, and, uh, you know, it's, I'm riding this one out for the for foreseeable future. It's going to be a not just a quick stash like I normally do. This is going to be a good musky season <laughs> uh, right right through the season. We're looking at this one. So I hope you guys like it. Thanks. Guys, I don't know if anyone is following along too closely in the comment box. I apologize if we're not. But uh, we just want to get you to maybe weigh in quickly here on between Joe and I, who has – the better mustache. And I don't, I don't care how you're ranking this, but certainly I don't want to influence you, but take into account the uniqueness of mine and oh, the length, the overall length. It just, it just poked me in the eye. <laughs> <laughs> That's wow. what he said, which isn't necessarily appropriate, Joe. Um, I, I don't know if we want to do more, too many more intros. Oh, you know what we could do? Who was all in the lakes? Uh, uh, Darcy was doing some seminar, musky seminars in Kenora today at Wood Lake Marine. So he wasn't fishing, right, Darcy? At the White Cap, yeah, for uh, Wood Lake Marine. They put on a uh, um, show and shine uh, at the uh, White Cap Pavilion. You get to test drive boats. It's going on all weekend out there. So, uh, yeah, did a seminar for them and, uh, and such this afternoon. Okay, so I want to ask all of you guys on your predictions of uh, what to expect for tomorrow. Uh, and this is like not everybody that's watching this obviously is going to be fishing Lake of the Woods. So people are just going to kind of get your guys insights from afar, from your research, from whatever you have surveyed on the water. I know that Darcy and Joe have been on the water lots doing other fishing over the last few weeks. And I understand that Luke was on the water this afternoon for a few hours surveying the land. What did you find, Luke? Uh, I was, I'm actually super excited about what we found today. So we were out, um, got to kill this real quick. Uh, we were just on some bass fishing, and uh, obviously bass are in the shallows right now, and we saw muskies in some deeper cabbage, and uh, we saw some muskies around some wood, and uh, we saw some on some deeper sand and some shallow sand. So they're uh, on a lot of different structures, and the fish looked really clean here. We were out on crow, and uh, it just I'm thinking it's going to be really, really good for us tomorrow. When you say clean, do you mean uh, that they're long done spawning or that they're not done spawning? No, I would say they're uh, a lot of any better than we saw today. Okay. And uh, did you see any sign of spawning activity, like any fish together or anything like that? Oh, uh, we did see one pair that was spawning. Oh, nice. Did you get some footage for your social media for that? Oh, I sure did. I had cameras everywhere. Were, they, were any of them hidden GoPros or were they all quite visible? Uh, they were all very nice. visible. Nice. 
Very nice. Okay, so uh, moving on to the uh, guys that are locals here and uh, going to be guiding here all year. What can you guys say about how you think this is a season is, is shaping up compared to other years? And uh, I don't know, like what to expect. Are we early? Are we late? Is it going to be an opener? Uh, I'll start with you, Joe. Is it going to be an opener in your prediction where you see no fish, where you see some and catch some, where you catch lots, or where you see tons and can't catch any? You got, you got any idea on that? Um, I guess, I guess it's hard for me to call right away. I, I, I can definitely say we're going to see some fish. Um, I'm hoping that I don't end up having to resort to going into some shallow weedy bays to see some fish. Uh, um, I know I'll be fishing some shallow weeds and stuff, but, um, uh, I've seen fish recently, bass fishing and, uh, um, should be able to find them pretty easy tomorrow you know it's kind of like deer season they're running all over the place before the season starts and then open today comes around all of a sudden everything changes but um um planning on having a good day tomorrow getting out there early and uh finding some fish up in those weeds in the base in weeds in the base what kind of weeds are you talking about like like submergent vegetation what kind of weeds um yeah submergent vegetation i like uh some some uh shallow sand bays um with what some weeds kind of weeds please um <laughs> the grassy kind of grassy weeds so not cabbage like strand strands but not pencil reeds you mean like submerged like submergent weeds did i not say that i meant submergent weeds below the surface on <laughs> sand is what i'm looking for shallow sand and weeds okay. maybe some pencil reeds too with some submergent reeds mixed in. Am I cutting you off to move on from this? Let's hear what Darcy has to say. Yeah, Darcy, what kind of weeds do you think he's talking about because he doesn't want to give us a direct answer? <laughs> uh, I would think maybe uh, sand grass, uh, maybe, um, you know, uh, and then, um, uh, of course, uh, any of those back bays, they usually have like a mix of cabbage and uh, I don't know what the one is called, um, but it looks like we, we call it spaghetti weeds. It's got that one single strand uh, that comes up. Um, the pubis, pubis the, weeds. Pubis. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's the ones. <laughs> and uh, yeah, yeah, you know, stuff like that uh, mixed with uh, uh, milfoil. I mean, there, there's, there's usually a whole mix of things that's in those back bays, you know. It's just a dark bottom bay. Uh, with all kinds of junk going on back there. And I, I haven't found any specific ones for spawn, you know, that's uh, better or worse than the others, you know what I mean? It just it just tends to be a huge mix usually because the bays are a decent size usually, you know. Okay, okay so uh, I know that weeds can be such a primary focus all summer, whether you're talking about here on Lake of the Woods or um, further remote uh, musky lakes or down in Minnesota. Like it's all about weeds for so much of the summer. And... Are we going to be going straight into that pattern like the weeds are up and that's going to be go time? Like, does anyone have an opinion on that? Are the weeds ready to go and that's what it's all about already? I, mean, I, I personally hate fishing weeds. So as soon as I can stop fishing weeds, I do. You know, and that's just what I can get away with on Lake of the Woods, um, you know, uh, with the amount of, of rock and stuff and the, the transition fish that, that leave right away and, and hang out on rocks all year. I mean, if I can get away with doing that as opposed to poking around in the weeds on some weird uh, um, weather pattern or something that's going on, you know, I'll, I'll fish weeds the whole time or yeah. rocks the whole time. That's interesting because like uh, we, we think about the fish moving from the back of the bays until they're on the furthest extensions uh, supposedly in the fall. Right. But uh I have heard of people catching good fish on extended points, uh, bingo, right at, right at uh, opening day, right? So, like, hey, uh, Luke, when you come up to Lake of the Woods and you're fishing typically in the East End and whatnot, are you are you looking at some points and having uh, success on points right away, or are you always focusing more so on bays? Luke, you gone? I bet you Luke's wife was like, ah, you can spend 10 minutes with the boys, but then you should probably take a night to the kids and... <laughs> She's already let him go uh, uh, on a musky fishing trip, so he can't spend all night Skyping with the... He's just a uh, icon on my screen right now, and that's it. So I kind of uh, alluded to the fact that Luke uh, Ronstrand doesn't have any social media whatsoever and barely knows how to use his phone. 
And we were so blessed to have him for a little bit here. I do not know if he's going to come back or not. So that is the explanation for Luke. He is um, a well-regarded member of the Muskie community in general and a very uh, busy Muskie guy. I will put his links in the uh, below, regardless of whether he shows back up or not. Um, you know, like we're going to talk about new baits and stuff here. But uh, one thing that I, I kind of uh, notice is that you guys keep talking about what you've seen already. Uh, Luke talked about the, all the muskies he saw already today. Um, like, let's talk about what's been going on for out of season and even what can happen as you're out there like today, which is still illegal, even though we know that it doesn't make any real difference between today and tomorrow um, for the fish. It's just like the laws, the legalities. So whether we're talking about what happened today, what happened yesterday, what happened a month ago, how do you guys feel about... Um, fish being let's say caught and uh, pictures posted on Facebook because I have seen lots of pictures posted on Facebook of muskies over the last few weeks and always uh, people are careful to mention that it wasn't a personal catch and that uh, it was you know hurried back into the water and all that um, but still a photo is attached to it which is like definitely questionable and I, I do believe that and just I, I know I'm going long-winded here but I want to represent these people before we're like perceivably, because I'm sort of anticipating how you guys might like sink your talons into them. Um, rather than uh, creating it like they're the uh, the the felons, um, they do describe that they know the season was closed, that they didn't mean to catch it, that they hurried it back into the water. So we do need to include all that, and I don't believe that they think they're doing anything illegal by taking that picture. I truly do believe that. So, um, Joe, you want to start? Uh, Darcy, you want to start? You guys have pains? Take her away, Joe. All right. Well, you know, we're going to just jump right into it. I mean, the the, uh, the musky out of season thing is obviously touchy. It can be perceived a lot of different ways. Guys say accidental catch or this or that. Um, uh, you know, uh, harassing any fish while they're spawning, I think, is looked down upon by most anglers. Uh, and so... Hold course, on, hold on, hold on. Don't go into harassing because that wasn't... That's, that's not the angle we're going at here. We're going to assume you're right. that nobody is casting at repeatedly a muskie that they know is out of season. We have to make that assumption for them. And we're talking more so about an accidental catch that they had no idea what was going to happen. And then the following activities do they leave the bay and disappear from there and go far from it to make sure they're you know like cut your hand off if it causes you to sin are they are they trying to keep their nose as clean as possible is that the idea um talking about taking pictures like talk about that stuff more so well yeah and harassing was a bad word but i i guess i meant what i meant uh by harassing is just um causing extra stress to the fish unnecessary stress to the fish while it's spawning um uh, and, um, you know, it's just, it's, there's, there's so many different ways to look at it, uh, I guess. I, but, um, what my opinion is, is, uh, I've, I've handled many fish preseason and it happens. They're out there. You're fishing areas where, uh, there's fish. I keep them in the water as best I can. Um, I usually, a lot of times people ask about catching muskies. They know I like to fish for muskies. I tell them right away that the season isn't open yet and we may end up encountering one, but we're not going to bring it in the boat for a picture. We're going to unhook it in the water and, um, you know, possibly uh, uh, a picture of you holding on to the tail of the fish as it swims off or uh, something that involves the fish in the water. Um, but we're not going to take it out. We're not going to measure it. Uh, I let them know that right away. And I feel like if I tell him, if I tell them that right up front and they know what the deal is, then, um, the, then when it happens, it's not, it's not awkward. It's not, uh, like, okay, now what am I going to do? This person just caught the biggest fish of their life. But now I have to explain to them that actually they're not going to be able to take a picture of it. They already know the deal. They know how I feel about it. And, um, and I don't want to promote catching those fish when the season isn't open. Okay. Okay. And 
Okay, I see what you're saying. And you know what I really like is the fact that you go out of your way to tackle the topic in advance because I feel like that does get the awkwardness out of the way. It's not like they all of a sudden feel like they've lucked into this fish. It's like they already know what's happening next. My question quickly, one word answer, does that, is that, so that's a blanket boat rule? Is that what you're uh, suggesting? Is that a, excuse me? Is it a boat rule that's going to apply to every guest, every situation? Yes. Okay, so now what if, and, and maybe somebody else wants is wanting to phrase this question, but what if it's a 12-year-old and this 12-year-old, I mean, we're gonna, I'm really going to create this situation, but this 12-year-old didn't catch a fish on day one, and now it's day two, and this 12-year-old catches a 40-inch muskie, and that's the first trip, first fish of the trip somehow for this 12-year-old. Are we going to make this 12-year-old bend over backwards? <coughs> okay. so, so I know that I'm really sculpting this, but... There are a hundred shades of gray between what I just said and the obvious one where it's like, come on guys, you know better. You're going to get your muskies next month anyways. Okay. So is it one rule for everyone in your boat? I feel like in a situation like that, I could get the kid to kneel down next to me uh, while I lean over the side of the boat. I grab the fish maybe by the tail and the belly and I lift it out of the water enough while, uh, while well, somebody gets a picture of me leaning over the side of the boat um, and, and you know, maybe kid is next to me or whatever, I try and figure out a situation where we can, re- we can get a record of the catch. But, uh, you know, and it would be a great example to explain to the kid, look, this, this fish is spawning. This fish is going to make, thousands, you know, potentially more fish for you to catch in the future. If we let it go and leave it alone, um, I like, you, you I like can it. come back and do this a lot more times. Yeah, I like it. Joe, Dar- uh, Darcy, Luke, uh, you guys want to reply to that or take it in a different direction? Or what do you want to, what do you want to go with for there? I, I'm the exact same way with, uh, with telling people, uh, you know, pre uh, going out even close, you know, to, to uh, the bays and such. Uh, if we catch an accidental muskie, it's, uh, it gets released both side. You know, nobody has a problem with it. Everybody's fine with it. Everybody understands that they're out of season. There's, there's no reason to take a picture of them. And, um, yeah, I mean, harassing them is bad. Putting stress on them is bad. Uh, when you take the hero shot, you know, the straight uh, hero shot um, with that fish, you push down on their bellies. You know what I mean? And with a big pregnant female, I mean, I've seen it in, during the season, you know, where we, we catch a, a, a big fish uh, in the season. It's still pregnant because it's a late uh, spring or what have you. Uh, and, you know, and they, and they spew out eggs once you start, once you put pressure on their bellies, you know what I mean? So that's, that's exiting eggs out of the, out of the fish, you know, less, uh, less, less eggs uh, out there for, for the actual spawning time. So um, I think there's no reason for it. I think you can get totally beauty photos at boat side. Uh, you that's know. what you strive for is what you're saying is the boat side photo as opposed to just unhooking it. Because unhooking it would truly be, we know this is illegal. We know we shouldn't have done this. This was a mistake, not an accident. This was a mistake in a way, the way you're describing it anyways. Yeah. Um, so then like that's almost suggesting you shouldn't even be trying to measure it. I would just straight, no, no, no measuring, no nothing, absolutely not. No, just keep it in the water the whole time. And, uh, uh, you know, if you usually you'll need with, with, you know, with these fish, you'll need to gill them at least, you know what I mean? Just to get some kind of control over their heads. I mean, you might be able to just slide the, the pliers in there without grabbing their gill and, and pop the, uh, you know, single jig out if that's what you got or whatever, if it's hooked in the tail of a, an X wrap or something like that. But, um, you know, uh, th- I was thinking about it too. The, I think the only situation where maybe, Maybe it's okay to, you know, grab a fish, bring it in is, I mean, if the, if the jig or whatever is down its throat, you're using, you know, eight pound fluorocarbon or whatever. And clearly the eight pound fluorocarbon is raking against its teeth um, and, you know, not getting a hold of that fish within a very uh, um, short amount of time. Um, it might, uh, it might break off. So, you know, maybe in that situation, if you see that, it's, it, slam away a few times like it uh, maybe gonna break maybe gonna break i mean maybe then sliding you know your little bass net over its head and making sure it's not going to at least swim away and you know and same thing you, you you throw the the net over its head you can still probably grab its gill at that point and and start removing hooks i don't think that changes your point because you're still saying expedite the whole process however you can 
however you can and and get the have somebody the whole once you know it's a muskie and it's on it's on white line you're gonna have plenty of time to have somebody else in the boat probably go get cameras and all that kind of stuff so go get that all ready get somebody else on that for when it you know when it's time to pop it off at boat side nice quick fast get whoever caught it sitting beside you while you're removing the hook and that's your memory you know videos too videos are great these days start videoing the whole thing instead of taking pictures you know what i mean it's it's just as good these days to put up a video, in my opinion. You know. Okay, I think I think we want to do it. Luke has to say, I just want to ask you one quick question, Darcy, and I want this to be as as brief and as accurate of an answer as you can do. Um, let's turn it into a uh, lake trout that appears to be a fifty pound lake trout in the fall. It is out of season. It comes to the boat, and and now everything you've just suggested is that we are going to expedite it at all costs. And now you see this lake trout that is is dizzying you to see it. So is it going to be the same rules applied and we are going to uh, get that hook out as fast as possible and not make an attempt to document the fish's uh, dimensions or uh, extend the process with the fish whatsoever. We're just going to try and release it as fast as we can. Yeah, yeah, you got it. Yeah, I, I think that's the that's same. That's how you would do it or that's how you would like to think you do it? Like that's legitimately what you would do if you brought a freak lake trout to the boat. I, I mean, I, I've caught, and I, I caught a 40-inch lake trout uh, two seasons ago. Why do we know how long it was? Well, 40 ish, <laughs> 40 ish, and it was. It no, was why do we know? We shouldn't know because we didn't take the time to right. document it. And and I didn't, and and we didn't, and we didn't document it. And uh, all there is is is, is uh, pictures of it uh, at both sides. You know what I mean? You're and guessing about 40 inches. Yeah, about 40 inches, and we got that because I have a picture with the 13 inch grandma in the side of its face, and we, you know. So forty ish. You know, I take your. Down. I do like your example. The only thing is, I said a freak lake trout, and I don't think you consider a forty inch a freak. I'm talking about a fish you okay. would consider. So, I mean, I haven't been in that situation. Who, <laughs> who knows exactly what I do then? But I'm pretty sure I would just release it both sides. I truly believe you would with a muskie, regardless of the dimensions. You would acknowledge that it is not your fish, that you didn't want to have anything to do with it, and you want it to have the absolute best chance, and I truly believe that you would not, as you have said, I believe you would, I do think there might be a double standard with another species in another situation. Right, right. Okay. Uh, Luke, what do you got going on? All right, so I, uh, I absolutely 100% appreciate, like, the way that you guys are, like, um, the way that you're going about handling the fish and when it is, and uh, I'm very lucky that I don't get the fish um, or I'm not fishing for muskies at the time when I'd have accidental catches. And I think most of like the grown men in my boat, um, you know, if we've caught them, uh, we've taken some pictures with them. Some of them we've just water released. Um, and I, I think most of the time, like the water releasing is the best way and that's the way we do it. But if it's a, if it's a kid, a young kid that catches it, um, I'm probably going to let them take some pictures with it, with some assistance. I really like what Joe was talking about, about, you know, getting down and getting really personal um, with that fish, but just the, the taking that whole experience, you know, as like a youngster, or uh, I would also make an exception for somebody that's old, um, that's older and it doesn't get out a whole lot. Uh, it's just, it is a really cool experience. Um, so it's just one of those things that I, I, I would let somebody document it um you know and, and capture that moment but i do agree that you can get amazing videos and amazing photos um i've just i'm not a very confrontational person so i probably i'm not going to tell somebody that they can't take a picture with it especially when i know that we're we're handling them you know the right way um so luke not to uh like i'm not going to come at it the same way that we were coming at it before but we come at it a little bit of a different way here i know when i was fishing with paul castellano uh i think we were in new york we might have been in ontario it doesn't matter the season's closed for muskie it's december we catch one while we're walleye fishing, and Paul is is kind of coming at this from an angle uh, unlike anything we've said here, and he is like, I am not risking anyone, whether they're looking at me with binoculars, whether it's another angler, whether it's uh, conservation, I am not even going to risk any perceived anything here. Okay, so this isn't really an angle that we've come at this yet, and I don't know, it doesn't sound like you're looking at it this way necessarily, but... But Paul's saying, I'm begging him to get a quick picture and document it in the water. And Paul is saying, someone could be watching. Someone could start a rumor. This is my livelihood. That's not our fish. We didn't want to catch that fish. We need to get rid of it as soon as possible. And I still took a picture, but Paul said, this is your thing kind of thing and, and didn't want to really be involved because that's how seriously he took it. And on the exact same topic, 
We did a multi-species challenge during 39 hours and they caught a tiger muskie and each fish is worth a point, each different species. And at no point did Paul and Taro even hint at the fact that they should have had a point for that tiger muskie, that they missed out, that that was debatable. They never even hesitated at it just because I guess martial law maybe down in Toronto is, is looked at a little bit differently or something, but they did not even consider that being their fish in any way. So it's, it's, it's coming at it a bit of a different angle. I don't know. What do you think of that? Luke, what do you think about the law side of it like that? If, if the law couldn't, is he frozen? If the law could enforce it that strictly, being that you're not supposed to retain the fish, when you bring a boat, a fish in the boat, you, it could be perceived you're re retaining it, especially if it's a uh, prolonged experience anyway. I think Luke's frozen. Yeah, I looked frozen on mine. He's beautiful. His hair is so flowing. Um, so, like, do you guys want to touch this at all? It feels, feels like you guys are kind of on the same uh, wavelength with this. Yeah. Yeah. I feel, I feel about the same there. That's, uh, you know, well, that's, that's I, the other thing with Luke is, and, um, I don't know if maybe he is referencing guiding in Minnesota, but I believe their uh, catch photo release of a fish out of the season is actually legal. Oh, it's uh, different. It's much different than Lake of the Woods, you're saying? Or Ontario? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I believe in Minnesota, on Minnesota Lakes. And and I guess I really maybe shouldn't be saying this because I'm not 100% sure Okay, comment it. box. Anybody know? <laughs> yeah, I, I, think, I think catch photo release of a fish in Minnesota – um, when that fish is out of season, I, I believe that's, uh, that's fine. And um, you know what? Like, I didn't mean to put Luke on the spot about the ethics stuff because I do everything I know about Luke is like, he's extremely straight shooter. So I feel like some of his opinions might be based on a slightly different law or level of enforcement that he's used to where he's from. So it could be that you're right, that it's, uh, yeah, people yeah. are you're saying you're correct. You're correct. So I'm thinking, yep, it is. Okay. So that right there explains uh, the different opinion from Luke. So that's kind of cool to see. So it, it's like we're kind of all gravitating back towards the same spot. Um, the only we're other just trying to stay, we're just trying to stay legal, and and you know, and I mean, we want the best for the fish as well. But just like kind of what Paul was saying to you, uh, you know, about other people seeing and his reputation, it's it's that same sort of thing with us up here and. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to uh, set an example, the wrong example for other people. And um, and I don't want people thinking that I'm out there uh, breaking the law when I'm not. So. so so the only other side of this I see, unless, uh, uh, Darcy, do you have another side? Yeah, of sure. so, so the only other thing I'm seeing is that it, it is possible that, like I was suggesting with a 12-year-old who's caught one fish, we might go to more of an effort to get him a photo, whereas normally we might be hurrying up a little bit more. Um, the only thing is, is like, I think that maybe it does need to be adapted a little bit more because I know like Darcy, for example, I know doesn't want to take a picture of a 48 inch and under musky himself, right? Darcy, like I've heard you have this attitude, like you're forcing yourself to take pictures of fish that size. Right. Yeah. For social media for business or stuff like that. But so, so we're all at a different stage in this. So Darcy's maybe at, you know, borderline the far extreme this way. The 12 year olds at the borderline extreme this way. So it's like, it's one thing for Darcy to say, oh yeah, I didn't hook it in the water. Well, Darcy also doesn't even care about a muskie unless it's huge and he's caught a bunch of huge muskies. So he's like, this isn't year one or year two Darcy we're talking about. We're talking about expert level Darcy giving advice to year one or year two everybody else, right? So yeah. it's, it's different. But um, what I will say is some of the like concerning posts I've seen are from guys um, posting muskies and pictures of muskies that they have taken the time to get good photos of. And we can't kid ourselves. That is a process. It's not crazy, but it's a process. Okay. Guys I've seen, and these are guys that do a lot of fishing. They're avid guys that potentially do musky fishing guys that'll be musky fishing tomorrow for musky. You know, like they pursue muskies all year long. They've got profile pictures of muskies and here They've been catching muskies incidentally while bass fishing and still taking pictures of them and posting the pictures of them. And so I feel like these people specifically are, they need to be acknowledging the issue and realize that they're borderline um, entering into the guide mentality of where Darcy and Joe, for example, have been in this game for a long time. It's caught a lot of big muskies. They can appreciate that we want to do everything we can to expedite the releases of these fish that 
don't belong to us and we had no right catching right now. So for those type of people, they should probably be able to see this a little differently than the 12 year old that I, that I brought up. Hey, uh, Luke, are you back on? Yep, I'm back. So, so I think what we kind of all figured out here, thanks to Joseph uh, suggesting it and then the comment box chiming in is that um, you, um, sorry, I got distracted by something about adult dating in the comment box. Is that, uh, Luke, Luke, is that you are influenced by Minnesota law, which actually suggests it's okay to catch photo release out of season fish. Is that, is that accurate? That's what the comment box um, suggested. I, I mean, I, I honestly, I guess what I'm, what I'm influenced is by just my, my own personal decision on what to do with the fish. Yeah, I guess. And, so I, I honestly, I never, like I said, I've, I rarely fish um, in Minnesota when I would be fishing for muskies, you know, when I'd have the opportunity to catch a muskie this season. So I, I've never even, or I haven't really paid attention to the laws with that. Yeah. So. Okay. Uh, Joe or Darcy, you guys have any more hot takes on this or should we move along? Um, <clears throat> I guess, I guess maybe one little uh, branch off I wanted to talk about was, uh, as far as taking pictures of muskies out of season, um, I want to know if you guys think there's a difference between uh, in Ontario here. Um, I know out of season is all the same either way. Um, I've caught muskies through the ice in the winter. Um, and I feel different about those fish than I do about the fish that get caught preseason in shallow water uh spawning bays in the spring um <clears throat> these fish that i've caught in the winter were while trout fishing active fish over deep water chasing baits uh cold water um a, a couple of these fish were uh taken out of the hole and we took pictures of them and they were put back immediately i didn't post pictures um, I didn't want to advertise that I was catching fish um, when the season is closed, but I, I didn't fear for those fish's well-being like I do for a muskie that is caught in the spring when it's spawning. These fish caught in the winter, um, you know, I feel like it's a different situation. And uh, it is a I just wanted situation. to know if any of these other guys feel like it maybe it's a di different situation as well. I don't know. I mean, out of season fish is out of season fish. I understand that. But uh, when it comes to the well being of the fish, I think a uh, musky caught in the winter is different than a musky caught in the spring. Yeah. I guess that's where I was kind of going with like my, my personal discussions that if, you know, like, you know, like, you know, when you catch one, like fish like that, like those are, those things are going to release absolutely fine. And I, I do agree, like the fish that are, that are caught, you know, this time of the year, the spawning, the spawning is incredibly stressful on them. Um, you know, even just carrying the, the eggs around pre spawn how many times, how many times have you been in these, these shallow water areas and you just see the fish laying there and they're comatose and you can just literally drive your boat right up to them and they won't move and you can touch them with your hands because they're so stressed out. So I, I would definitely agree with that. I mean, it's just, you just gotta, you know, use good judgment when you're handling a fish. I mean, it's no different than catching one in the summertime and it's, it's all stressed out from being hooked really bad. There's been many of those fish that we've 50 inch fish that we've never taken out of the water and taken photos of, you know, just because of you know, they're potentially hurting the fish. So I would, I would definitely agree with you and share that same opinion. Yeah. And I think like same thing, I've, I've only caught one muskie ever through the ice. I don't ice fish even close to as much as uh, Joe does. So, you know, you're, you're going to have more encounters obviously, but uh, I, I, I feel like, you know, a, a big part of, of, you know, not taking them out of the water um, during this time of year um, is because of the eggs getting spewed out, you know, when you're, when you're pushing on their belly. I think that's a, a pretty main deal as well. And uh, I feel like in, in the winter time, I mean, there is eggs developing, but uh, I feel like they're not at their full maturity. And, you know, it's not like you touch its, its belly and, and eggs come spewing out in the winter time, you know, which is, you know, uh, a different than what you see when you catch one this time of year and uh or uh you know late uh, late spawn uh in the season some people just just like maybe um just say to luke maybe the law is a little bit different here and it's a little bit more strict than than minnesota 
and to like address what, what Joe and uh, Darcy just said about situationally with that, people are really stressing in the comment box that uh, it's illegal to, to take the picture of the water. So I guess those people are on the straight and narrow. That's good to hear, but it's, it is something to keep in mind that if it's illegal, that really doesn't mean that you can't expedite a photo or somebody snapping photos while you're expediting the fish. Like there, you know, there's levels to this, but it does mean, you know, let's, you don't want to be doing a photo shoot. Like there's nothing to be gained from doing a photo shoot and really capturing the moment when it isn't your fish and you don't want to catch the fish. And part of that's like what Joe said is having the discussion in advance, like just going over it. We're not taking pictures of these fish or we're going to try not to, and they aren't our fish. We don't want to catch them. And then when it happens, it's like, I didn't want it to happen. And I saw somebody in the comment box said a hundred percent here. It's still here. It's Lunker Hunter. Uh, if these guys caught a 55, they would take a picture 100%. Okay, Lunker Hunter, um, you should be saying they might take a picture 100% because you don't know what any of the, any of us would do. We are all on very different levels here. Maybe some of us are on the same level as you and amongst us we're on different levels here, but uh, you don't know what we would all do. Put it this way, I think, I think the only uh, exception to my even like no measuring rule. I mean, if I looked at it and it was like, and it was clearly 56 plus, that's kind of like, you know, the zone where I'm in awe uh, in this area. If it was 56 plus, you know, a 60 or something like that, I would definitely want to throw it on the board in the water. I would put the bumper board into the water and I'd roll it onto the board take the measurement, do the videos in the water, and then slide it off the board and goodbye. That's, so that's like you're your team then, because you're not expediting it and you're actually, oh shoot, it flipped off. Here, pin it down. We need to get the measurement. Like If that happened and it rolled away, then fine. But it's all happening in the water. I'm not going to do a hero shot with it. I don't care if it's 57. That's Okay, so if you can get some perspective while handling it as little as possible. Okay, uh, unless you guys want to hit this a little bit, I think uh, we'd probably beat this topic up. We've yeah, Got some different perspectives on it, which is good and, and whatnot. Um, okay, uh, can, Luke, can you hear me still right now? I can still hear you, yeah. Okay, I need you guys all three to answer at the same time here, okay? So I'm going to ask a question, and all three of you are going to answer at the same time, okay? Are you ready? Right? Are you ready? Okay. What is the moon phase tomorrow? <laughs> I haven't even looked. Let me look. <laughs> Luke, do you know? <clears throat> I want to say the the new moon was just a few days ago, so. You want to say, or you're pretty uh, sure? Yes, new moon was a few days ago. Wow, and Joe and Darcy, who guide here on Lake of the Woods, and they're musky fishermen, whether moon phases matter or not, you'd think they'd still be aware of it. I'm still fishing tomorrow, so what's the difference? As long as I know moon up and moon down, I'm still out there doing it, so. I know, it feels like you'd be. My moon, phase, my moon phase is the fish don't bite until we get there. <laughs> yeah, you got it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll, so I, I actually will. Um, I will plan my day around the uh, the majors and uh, majors and minors tomorrow for sure. Yeah. How so exactly? How will How will you plan your day around it? You've got, uh, you know, you, you're going to want to put yourself on good spots all day. So just to, hey, walk us through how you'll sort of uh, plan your day to to. to concentrate your best attack on what what parts of the day tell us exactly what what the parts are and and how you'll do it so well we basically like we basically were fishing the clear water part of lake of the woods over here um and uh we typically do find like our best our best fishing is from about nine nine ten in the morning till the sun hits the trees um we'll get a good we'll get a good you know it seems like the fish are going to get more active the higher the sun gets in the sky but um it's there are definitely some spots that are much better than others that we will be hitting at, at those key times. And uh, you'll watch, you'll, we'll watch the fish get active leading, leading up to those times and after. I mean, some of these, you know, a major will be a good, a good, uh, sometimes even an hour, hour and a half feeding window where we'll be fishing. But did you guys, did you catch all that? You talked about the sun between nine and 11, like the height of the sun more so than you talked about the major and minor there. So, well, that's just, I mean, that's, that's just one, I guess the, uh, just the duration of the daylight and the, the warm, you know, the water is going to be the warmest when the sun is highest. Okay. Um, that matters a lot. And then, uh, you know, you just, you, you compile that with, uh, like a major or minor moonrise and moonset and you just like, we'll go to our best areas 
Um, and that's, you know, just try and maximize those feeding windows. I mean, like when we're fishing, we're fishing very low populations of fish and we definitely see those, you know, like those concrete feeding windows that you can predict, those predictable windows are just, they're a huge deal for us. Okay, so I know people are probably wondering this uh, that are out there planning their day. They've got their best spot in mind. Do they avoid it until what you perceive to be the time or do they hit it right away because they can't wait and they've been thinking about it for the last three weeks, unless they've been bass fishing there in the last few weeks. Um, do, they, do, they, do you go hit right away and then circle back to it during the prime time? So you're hitting it multiple times or are you just waiting to really double down on it at the prime time? Uh, it depends. Um, there are times where I will go to my best spots, you know, a couple times during the day. Um, we, we definitely kind of have a, you know, like a, a game plan in mind when we go out. We have like kind of a systematic approach to areas that we go through. But depending on what we, by what we see as the day progresses, we will double back on, on some of those areas. Okay. Um, hey, is, is the major... It, it, is the major the moon high and low, and then the minor is the moon on the sunrise, uh, like on the horizon? Uh, the it's the minors are generally uh, moon rise, moon, and then majors are generally moon overhead, moon underfoot. Okay, hopefully everybody in the comment box paid attention to that, because that's a key little point there. And do you actually, like, the, the wording suggests that major is better. Is that what you find? Because I know that, I want to say Booker did extensive research and he uh, surmised that actually minors were what was worthy and that he doesn't even do anything with majors. So do you find majors is definitely more important to you or about the same? I'm going to say it's the, the majors. You cut off for me. No. <laughs> Oh, I was about to get so juicy. Yeah. It. It's, it's like he's like, I'm telling them too much, and then he moved it. To <laughs> Wi-Fi. Yeah. Oh, Dude, sorry. Uh, I'm going through a tunnel. I'm about to lose service. You guys want to talk uh, how you're going to approach your day, or do you want to specifically unpack the majors and minors and how you guys deal with that a little bit more? Give her. I guess for me, for me, starting out here, uh, majors and minors on the first day, I'm probably not paying attention as much to as I am just getting out there, um, looking at what type of structure we got, weed growth, how that's coming up, different spots like that. I'll probably, uh, obviously, I'm going to take a look at majors and minors before I head out in the morning. But, um, uh, you know, I don't think I have any places necessarily in mind where I'm going to be at any certain times. Um, I have some places where I know I want to look at right away. Um, maybe if we see some fish worthy of going back on during a prime time, yeah, I'll, I'll probably pay attention to it. But until then, I'm just going to be I'm just going to be inspecting everything and just seeing what I find as far as fish activity and, and structure. Run spots, try and turn over some fish, and then maybe start thinking about the prime time sort of thing. That's that's what I'm thinking. Yep. Okay. And which of which, just before we move on uh, from you and see what Darcy thinks, uh, which of those do you pay the most attention to out of like say uh, majors and minors, which pertain to the moon or sun or or neither or both? Like when you if you, if you have like six fish lined up, when are you hitting those six fish next? Like you said. Um. <clears throat> I guess. Um, I guess. Uh, would be probably miners. Miners, I guess, are what I'm looking at. Moonset, moonrise. Moonrise, yeah. Moonset, moonrise, sunset, sunrise. I think those are. I see activity and 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 stuff at other times, but those are probably my times where I'm really focusing on where I'm going to be. Okay, uh, Darcy, are you feeling the same way about m how you react to the moon? Are you more looking at other factors in the weather? Are you like, wh where does your priorities lie with this? Yeah, uh, the way that I run my uh, my services, I, I usually, you know, it's either a 8, 10, 12 hour day, 14 hour day, whatever. And I always run it into last light and, uh, you know, sundown. Um, and you're gonna have some kind of, um, you know, peak and, and valley, of course. Uh, in that eight hours that you're out there leading up to that uh so that'll be the way that i that i'm running uh, on opener uh, i'll do a milk run uh go hit uh, the spots that i want to uh that you know that traditionally have been good this time of year and uh let the day kind of unfold if there's a certain uh, section that's doing better than the rest then i'll uh 
um, you know, jump back to it during the peak times. And, um, you know, if there's a fish that I want to get, I'll go back to it during those peak times. And uh, uh, Either one, I, like moon or sun? Yeah, you got it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and especially, I mean, the, the moons and and, uh, and such are, are you know, huge. Um, sundown, like I say, I, I run all my guide trips into sundown and last light. So those are those are big deals to go back on on the stuff then, of course, as well. So Okay. Um Okay. Uh, and in terms of how you're going to start your day tomorrow, um, are, you, are you about the same? You're going to run a bunch of spots. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll milk run. That's, you know, makes sense. Um, logistically, you know, closest and, and start working my way out and, uh, see what's happening where, you know what I mean? And, uh, see where the active fish are, see where the big ones are more than anything. Right. We always want to catch the big ones. So line those ones up and go back to them later. Okay. So let me ask you this. It's kind of a follow-up question to the, the way you're angling this is um, would you rather uh, spend less time driving around wasting the client's time because we all know how clients can be like make jokes about how they're paying for a boat ride, right? So would you rather be extremely efficient and hit a bunch of spots, you know, like every spot in sight that is perceivably good that you've had experience on or looks good or would you rather be like boom, hit a couple things here, move along and see if something's going on somewhere else? Like do you get – any sort of a like a preference with that in terms of uh, scanning as much area as you can or breaking down smaller areas? Uh, for for this time of year, I have like you know same thing traditionally active areas, and I'll uh, uh, go into that section. And usually, there's you know three or four things that I want to hit there. Um, I mean, if that's totally dead, the stuff on the inside of the base, stuff on the outside of the base, uh, then yeah, I'll definitely uh, check out a different section. You know, if I'm not feeling it by um, you know, halfway through the day, then uh, then I'm going to go check out a different area and, and see what's going on, especially if, you know, the activity is really low. So Okay. Yeah. So what you're kind of hinting is at is you want to sample uh, distinctly different areas. So, Joe, do you uh, sort of witness some of the same stuff about seemingly some areas being cold and you want to get out of that area and perceivably get to an area that's hot and then you find an area that's hot and you really want to, like, not to overuse the expression, but you really want to dump double down on that specific area and hit everything in that area because it seems like it's hotter than everything else. Have you, have you uh, experienced that? I mean, the, it's, it's such a tough thing for, for me to look at, but cause there's so many variables, right? Especially, you know, you're looking at majors, minors, weather changes, um, stuff like that. But I, I do kind of feel like there's certain times uh, where one area can be hot and another area can be cold, whether it's uh due to some sort of hatch that's happening and causing the bait um, to be a little bit more active or less active in one area. Um, I feel like there's times where, you know, uh, Lake of the Woods, and not there's, there's not just times where it's like this, but Lake of the Woods plays out like, you know, a half a dozen different lakes put together. And uh, I, I've only guided on Lake of the Woods, but I know guides that uh, guide on multiple lakes and they, can say that one lake will be much better than another lake that is in the same region at the same time and um and i feel like lake of the woods is the same way there's one section of lake that can be hot and one section of lake that might be cold and of course it takes uh you know you got to be fishing every day you got to be on the water every day to really notice these things um but is your best, is your best explanation that it has to do with hatches, et cetera? Is, is hatches your absolute best guess? Do you want to add any other guess to that? Because just the reason I'm asking this way is that all we hear about is moon phase, pressure, all this stuff. That's all we hear about. If, if this side of the island's hot and way over there, a few islands down is cold, they're all experiencing the same pressure. They're all experiencing the same moon phase. So uh, is hatches your best guess or do you have a better guess? Or another guess. I, that's going to be what my best guess is. Um, you know, I, like one one example that I use to come about this is uh, walleyes. I do some walleye fishing early season here, and um, there's certain areas of the lake, certain bays in the lake, where the rock reefs turn on before any other areas of the lake, and uh, the you notice the walleyes are just packed full of crayfish in these areas. And so it's like the crayfish are molting or whatever they do ahead of other areas of the lake. Okay, and so, here we go. And, and you know what I'm saying? You yeah. know what I'm saying? So it's like, uh, say, Bishop Bay, for example, the, the rock piles there turn on for walleyes before Little Traverse Bay. 
and uh, the the fish in Little Traverse Bay are still eating bugs or or whatever, and uh, the fish in in Bishop Bay are full of crayfish. And even though this is completely different species, I feel like they can work. They definitely, I feel like they work together. Okay, so and, I just, I went to the fly fisherman and when I heard hi hatches, all I was thinking about was bugs. But you mean forage, you mean bugs, you mean crayfish, you mean minnow growth, you mean all the different forage and how they're maybe progressing differently in different areas of the lake. Absolutely, yep. Um, Luke, you might have missed the intro to this topic, but we were talking about how one area of the lake seems to be hot and another area of the lake seems to be cold. Do you think that that is just something that uh, you trick yourself into believing based on progression of the day and you start hitting a few hot spots and it's like, you know, it's not time of day. It's like, this area is hot. Like, I really need to spend my time in this area of the lake. Or do you think it's more so other factors? Like, and if it is an area that's hot, how would you explain why that area is hot and two miles away you know, on other good musky water doesn't seem to be hot right now? So are we talking about like this time of the year and tomorrow or are we just talking about in general? Well, you could talk about it in general or you could talk about specific to this time of year if the answer is a little. I think I, I, I was talking about a little, a little more in general. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> I would say for um, like for, for this time of the year, I would absolutely 100% say water temperature and uh, not necessarily the water temperature just in the shallows, but the water temperatures in the different basins. And when, when those temperatures get to a certain, you know, it gets to a certain warmth that the fish move shallow. Um, but just in general, I would have to say like down on Vermilion, a lot of it is, a lot of it is driven most of the year by bug hatches. Okay. We have the, where the mayflies drive the whole food chain. And uh, when we have hatches, it'll pull the, the muskies off of like your traditional structure and it pulls them into the open water and that, you know, and then they'll move back in the, um, and with the different water temperatures, wind directions, they'll pull, um, you know, they'll pull back in shallow. But a lot of times if we see a basin go cold up on, uh, on Vermilion, it's because there is a big bug hatch happening. Oh, so you don't mean cold water. You mean if, it, if it's going cold for fishing, it's because the bug hatch is, is kind of offsetting everything? Yeah, I should have used a different word there. But yeah, <laughs> definitely. I mean, that's, that's definitely our biggest factor down, down south. Uh, Darcy, any thoughts on this? Um, uh you know, I, I, I agree with exactly what they've said. Uh, I think um, metabolism has something to do with it as well. You know, um, when the water temperature is at its peak, uh, their metabolism is at its peak. So they're eating and metabolizing, eating and metabolizing a little bit more so than when the water's cold. So it just makes for a, a more active fish, you know, once the water temperatures reach those ideal zones. I shouldn't have said peak temperatures. I said I should have said ideal uh, zones, you know, for, for muskies at 75 degree range, you know, so, um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's the water that I chase sometimes uh, on the lake here, you know, uh, if things aren't happening in certain sections, the water temperature is too low, uh, you know, go check somewhere that uh, has a little bit higher temps and uh, things might be, might be going there. And of course, later on the season, it could switch over the other way and you're looking for maybe some lower temps, right? You got it. Yeah. Joe, thought? I was, Luke, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna bring. I was gonna bring that up. I've uh, I've had a lot of different people tell me that like, the preferred musky, um, well, their preferred temperature range temperature range is sixty five to seventy five degrees, and uh, I think that's how you do see muskies wind up in some really weak spots, especially like in August. Oh, you know, when you'll people, people have them. They'll talk about them being ah, that losey guys. No, you're still sort of there. We heard the key water temperature. I thought we were going to lose you right before the key water temperature. 65 degrees. Everybody write that down. Watch oh, no, out for it's 65. 60, 65 to 75 degrees. Okay, all up to 75. Wow. So you really want to be looking for that. And if it exceeds that, you want to look for cooler. And if it's below that, you want to try and get into that, you're saying? Yes, absolutely. And, of course, wind can play a huge role in moving that water around and affecting where that area is going to be. Like, it can change a lot from day to day. Yes, totally. A bass fishing on Shoal Lake. Good point, day, eh? Bass fishing on Shoal Lake the other day. Uh, south end of the lake, water temp was only 53. Moved up just a few miles into some uh, more shallow water. The water temp jumped up to 10 degrees, six, 63. 53 to 63 with only a few miles in between. See any muskies? No muskies. Didn't see any. Lots of bass. Back further into 65, I think. There's no muskies in Shoal. <laughs> oh. well, um, okay, a lot of people, you know, this is maybe a little too uh, 
people are glossing over some people are glossing over at this these intense topics so like i think here's a good juicy one that everyone wants to uh hear is uh what are some of the biggest muskies like whether you want to just mention like one memorable really big one that you've uh handled over the years or uh a couple of different ones that come to mind but uh darcy why don't you tell us either your biggest or your most memorable or just a little quick fish story a couple minutes long we'll move on to everybody else here uh, definitely, uh, my, my biggest fish is a 54 and a half. It came two minutes away from the launch in Kenora. I caught it in my 14 foot tinner that I had at the time. Um, yeah, fattest, biggest fish that I've ever caught still to this day and, uh, have seen nothing like it. I have another 54 and a half, uh, that was caught, uh, summer casting, but, um, you know, you guys can go check out the pictures of it on, uh, uh my personal uh, Facebook page, I think as the picture you scroll way back. Um, yeah, just, just a totally mental fish. Um, one of those crazy stories had all kinds of crazy, uh, boat problems at the beginning of the day. Didn't get out until 12 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, didn't have a finder on the boat. Uh, hit uh, one of these reefs, not twirled around one of these reefs and, uh, and boom, that fish came 10 inch Jake. Totally unbelievable. Uh, you know, made my life of musky fishing. So, did you get a girth on it? Because I know that's a topic we might get into if we have time. Did you get a girth or any other dimensions on it besides the length and that it was fat? Nope, girth. Uh, no girth. No, no girth. girth. So are you kind of oh. left sort of completely guessing, not even guessing? Like, because obviously people would have to ask you, they love asking this, how heavy was that fish by your best guess and stuff like that? Yeah, I, I think it was close to 50 pounds. You know what I mean? It, it, it was silly fat. It was fat from uh, head to tail. Um, so, you know, the, those measurements, you know, 48 pounds usually or something like that, 48 to 51 pounds, I think, on uh, most of the um, calculators from, you know, the 26 to 28-inch girth, we kind of maybe thought it was it was in, you know. I hate guessing on stuff like that when, when we don't actually measure it. Of course. Is 26 to 28 kind of as big as one can expect a girth to get on Lake of the Woods in general? What Like, I, I've very rarely heard of 30, but I think I have heard of maybe one or two legendary 30-type girths. Yeah, exactly. I, I think, you know, the 28-inch the range, you're, you're getting way top end kind of thing. So, um, you know, even uh, the – I think it was uh, – uh, who who caught that? Uh, that there was that uh, sixty by twenty nine and a half. You know what I mean? That thing looked absolutely massive. Um, and you know, I think that's getting up super top end. Those St. Lawrence fish and stuff like that, and some of the things that are coming out of Millax as well. But uh, and and Lake of the Woods. I mean, I, I think yeah. You know, those fifty four and a halfs. Uh, the the top end for us, the fifty fives, uh, are you know are are packing some crazy girths too. You know, and they're head to tail. Uh, thick as well so okay joe uh you got a fish you want to tell a story about <clears throat> i have a couple of good ones myself but last season uh my girlfriend boated no, no. a uh yeah my girl real life human bay? girlfriend bay caught uh a uh a 53 inch musky it was mid-september casting it was kind of the cast that you uh, you dream of while you're you're out there. Um, as darkness was falling, last spot of the day, last cast. Uh, you know, fish bites at the end of the cast, cranks it into the net. It was just, it was really a, a great fish, super healthy. Once again, didn't get a girth on it. Um, but it was a what's huge fish. It's important to mention. I don't think we mentioned. What's the name of the angler that caught this fish? My girlfriend. Does she have a name? <laughs> Bree Jovic, professional girlfriend angler. Nice. Uh, yeah, she, she, I mean, it was unbelievable. I got footage of it. I've done some editing on it. I don't put it on YouTube because I'm lazy, I guess, or I don't know why, but I should get it up there. It's a great, great clip. Joe does have a YouTube account. Uh, the link is not in the description right now, but come back in an hour or two or tomorrow and grab the link for Joe's YouTube account. Uh, the content is uh, very weakly produced, but the content is very juicy. There's some amazing musky strikes in there and uh, some really cool raw, ultra raw stuff. And what I'm told is anything we've seen is uh, teasers and the, all the best stuff is to be released. Is that, uh, is that accurate? I have I have about a dozen videos of forty eight inch plus muskies, uh, including a few a few fifties and that fifty three that 
that uh, they're just sitting on the computer. I got to, you know, it'd be nice if I knew someone who could put together a good video and I was gonna maybe suggest, get them to help me do it. I was going to suggest Luke, but he just went offline. Mm, that seems to be how everything goes for me. But, you know, it's fine. Got, got a fish tomorrow, so. Okay. I, did you really break down the catch? Can you just break down the very moment of the catch a little bit to bring us right into that moment? Because you said it was so perfect with the sun setting, but – you, like, did Bree pick her lure? Did she pick the cast? Like, what would like what was going on in that exact moment? Were you guys getting along? Were you fighting? I know girlfriend and boyfriend like to fight in the boat sometimes when they're fishing. There's a little bit of tension. So it's funny. It's funny because uh, um, she had just caught a pike just before that, and uh, she like I saw her lift her rod up, but it was a small fish, and she really wasn't even sure if she had a fish on, and uh, I kind of had to tell her that she had a fish on, which I feel like she's past that in her angling experience. She should know when she has a fish on, even if it's a small pike. And so it's funny because Zosky was only maybe a less than 10 casts later. And, uh, and she casts out and I'll say it was a go, it was a beautiful cast landed in a great spot on this beach, a little rock outcropping from the beach landed right there. And, um, and uh, she cranks in just a couple of cranks in and this fish bites and she sets a hook into it. And she says, definitely a fish this time. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. This one's definitely a fish. And it was, I mean, it, she was right. I'm going to give it to her. She was right. Nice. Okay. That sounds pretty epic. And so she basically did a better job with a 53 inch musket than she did with a 28 inch pike. Absolutely. Yeah. She knew right away. Picture moments. I, I was very proud. Hey, in case we're about to run out of time, I know Darcy's guiding at 4 a.m. and Joe, you probably are guiding not long after that. Yeah. Get me out of here. Do you guys want to quickly touch on any new new baits to the market that are exciting that most of the viewers probably have not heard of? Um, do you want to talk about uh, rumored freaks of the lake that we can never seem to get a verified measurement on the absolute true biggest fish? Like, you want to go down which of those roads if we don't have time for both? Let's go down the new lure road. <laughs> oh, Darcy's a little <laughs> controversial. Okay. Um, what do you got for uh, – we'll start with you, Darcy. Well, no, no, no. We're going to start with Luke because Luke looks like he's actually there. Luke, can you hear us? Yep. Luke, I got to – I'm back. Hit us with – while you're here, I didn't mean to cut Darcy off, but hit us with your, like, one or two most exciting baits coming out. I know you've actually been – I saw it today by accident – You've been designing a bait with a, like alongside Musky Innovations. Maybe that's not the bait you're most excited about, but I would hope it is. Um, hit us with one or two baits you're most excited about that you feel the viewers on average have not heard about yet. Um, well, I, I, am a, I do absolutely love those swimming dogs that I was a part of designing. I mean, paddle tails have been a, like a, a, trendy, a trendy thing for like literally half a decade now. Um, but they're really good for big fish bass and uh, – I guess what separates that one from everything else, it's got a flexible harness and it's got a really, it's got a really quick, hard kick to it instead of like a, a slow thump. And I really like that. Um, as far as other, pro as far as new things, uh, so I don't, know crazy don't move on quite yet. Don't move on quite yet because I don't feel people necessarily caught the details there. We're talking about uh, like swim baits. I'm very familiar with uh, like water wolf lure Shadzilla. The one you're talking about is one you worked on with Musky Innovations the maker of Bulldog, just to like really quantify it so people are going to be able to find this. I'll put the links for this in the description too. But Bulldog has like kind of invented that bizarre creature bait with the long tail. I feel like that's the first one that really turned a twister tail into a massive twister tail with a bunch of trebles. Um, and you made a swim bait of that. What's it called? A swimming dog? So it's a swimming dog. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it doesn't actually look like a Bulldog, though. it does look like your, um, your traditional paddle tail bait. Yeah, but the biggest difference between between that one and uh, other baits that are on the market is uh, it's got a flexible harm. It's swims really nice, but the hook placement on it's really key. I mean, I don't know how much time you've spent, you know, fishing with big swim baits with, uh, for muskies. Well, a, a lot of times they really headhunt those beats and eat them um, and eat them head first. And I found like through the prototyping phase of that. Like the further back that you had the hooks on the bait, the fewer, uh, the fewer, like the strike to the net ratio was really bad. Okay. And uh, by moving that front hook uh, further forward, that it became a much better hooking bait. Okay. Any other, any other baits you want to mention besides that one? 
Well, I uh, I absolutely love like the musky frenzy bait. Um, you know, they're your classic uh, um, your classic tinsel bucktails. But yeah. what really separates his stuff from uh, the other baits. He's got a three blade model, which is great. We caught a lot of big fish on those. But it it really does come down to just that one piece clevis and just having a just a different presence and making a different noise in the water. Um, it's a really big deal down by us where we see an obscene amount of fishing pressure. We're just a little tiny detail like that on a bait can make the difference between seeing 20 and catching three and, and seeing four and having a shot at one. I mean, it can something I'll be, as small hey, as I'll like be that. Running, that uh, little, I'll you know. be running some triple blade Apaches tomorrow. I got some. Who, who makes these guys? Because I'm going to have to find the link to put in the description. What, what's the name of the brand? Did he say Apaches? I said Apaches. Apaches the brand? Yeah, is it is Apache Bucktails, right? Or is it Apaches, yeah. Okay, so Luke's gone at another key moment we needed the most. We will find yeah. that point in the description. Do you guys know, uh, Joe, do you know how the triple blade design is? Is it literally three in, in, in all in the same plane as opposed to two in the same plane? Or is that third blade somewhere else? No, yeah, it's, um, okay, so it is three... It is a triple clevis, and they are at three points, like a okay. triangle. Yeah. Each clevis, and it's all together in one. It's one piece. Have you used so it before? The blades are always the blades are always opposite from each other, like a like a triangle opposite. Have you used it? Yeah, yeah. I'll say um, they're good baits. They catch fish. I they. I, I like using them, but I do got to pop them to get the blades going every now and then. But that's just part of a small blade bucktail. Luke, what's the brand name? What's that? Musky Frenzy? It's our there it is. There. Okay, Musky Frenzy. Um, so that yeah. bait, I'm assuming, has a lot of lift and would ride high in the water column with that extra blade? He runs them a little bit. He runs a little bit of extra weight on them because there is some extra, with, there is some extra wind or like, Air resistance when you cast them. Yeah. So I want to say most of the baits have like a three quarter ounce weight on. So they run, they run basically like a traditional bait. Have I used them? Sure. Have you used them? He has. <laughs> <laughs> he has used them. He probably designed them yeah. and we couldn't even hear from him that he's used them. Uh, Darcy, what's your bucktail of choice or any other lure you want to mention? Um, Cool one that's uh, that's coming out this year is by uh, Fish Whistle Lures. Um, it's uh, the Musky Buzz. It's a gigantic uh, buzz bait. Uh, it's really big. I, I forget exactly how many inches it is. I think it's about it's either 10 to 12 inches long. Uh, full uh, tinsel on the bottom. Uh, the blade on the top. You know, the one of the big things that's coming out these days is the actual bu uh, buzz bait is you know hitting the body of the uh, of, of the bait. Uh, and, or the, the blade is hitting the body of the bait. Uh, this one has that, but it's got a sleeve that goes over the wire. So it actually, uh, you know, makes it a little bit easier for that uh, blade to spin around and doesn't catch it up as much as some of the other ones do. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of excited to check that bait out. I haven't thrown it yet. Don't, uh, you know, might mark, mark my word that it's going to be a game changer or anything, but uh, I've been looking for a good buzz bait that I can use for a lot of years that uh, doesn't require fine-tuning every every cast practically so uh, i'm hoping that uh, this one's going to do the trick what bucktails are you using like for bucktail specific uh kelly's customs is what i use uh he's uh he's the guy that i'm with um makes uh, a solid bucktail you know uh the guy that i'm with i can't hear what you're saying aaron the guy, he's the guy that I'm with. I'm just quoting you. He's the guy that I'm with. <laughs> oh god. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, um, he's my sponsor, he's a sponsor of mine. Yeah. Uh, so anyways, but uh, yeah, it makes a solid bucktail. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's the thicker gauge wire, uh, the heavier, uh, clevises, um, and all that stuff, uh, well tied bait. Um, uh, I don't look for anything crazy. I like a little bit of difference in, uh, in vibration. So, you know, I'll go to things like hex blades and stuff like that. I, I love the idea of, of the triple blades too. That's great. Uh, Kelly, uh, uh, or Scott, pardon me. Um, makes those as well if you if you want the uh, the triple bladed stuff just anything that's a little bit different from the norm you know especially those big huge fish that uh, have maybe been caught before. Okay, uh, quickly, Darcy. Give them a little bit of um, vibration sound there. Hey, quickly, Darcy. I'm going to Lake of the Woods or I'm going somewhere in the area. 
I, I usually buy every size and every color, but this time I just want to buy two colors. Which colors may be very different ends of the spectrum, maybe just the two best colors you recommend. What can you tell me for which two colors I should buy on my uh, Lego Woods trip? Right. I'm a natural uh, color kind of guy, so I always say feed them what they eat every day. Um, black and silver bucktail, silver, silver bucktail. Um, uh, black uh, bladed, silver skirted bucktail. Um, blue and silver, you know, the, the natural stuff is what I use. And I pretty much use it throughout the season. You know, there's, there's not much variation. If the, the water's super dirty and stained and, you know, uh, algae and all that kind of stuff, then it all, I'll throw some orange on there so they can maybe see it a little bit better. But like I was saying, it's, it's, it's all about vibration and, and stimulating the lateral line. So um, as long as I got uh, the, the good vibrations out there and something that isn't going to weird out a big fish either, you know, you don't want to, uh, some big fish that's been caught on some uh, orange or, or just even, is weirded out in general. You know, those fish tend to be a little bit smarter, it seems like, and I would just rather feed them stuff that they eat every day. Joe, what is so funny? Is it about bucktail color? Is something else going on? <laughs> no, no, this is great. What's your bucktail yeah. color of choice? <clears throat> I like a chartreuse blade and an orange blade and a black skirt. Okay. Oh, like that's your one color? Like, would you, would you rather I get two of that color or should I get another option? Yeah, get two like that. There you go. Wow, you're being very <laughs> open. Luke, you want to talk colors or no? Yeah, I'll go. I'll throw colors. We'll be fishing the, uh, or I'll, I'll give some colors. We'll be fishing clear water tomorrow. So uh, I'm going to say that red and copper is going to be our number one choice. Um, red and the gin clear water seems to work amazingly well. Um, and then I'm also a big black, black guy black black under almost any water any clear water dirty water any conditions is always really good so it doesn't matter what color it is as long as it's all black uh, yes right. exactly yeah um uh, just darcy touched on top waters a little bit has everybody gotten up to speed with the newest uh, most exciting top water that's entered the uh the musky realm this year the uh bone saw boner saw <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Luke, are you familiar with the bone saw? And have you seen the video? I shaved. I shaved my I, I with the bone saw. I absolutely did see the video. That was uh, that was my favorite. Um, favorite things I watched on YouTube this winter. Really? Okay. Yeah. Dar oh, bummer. Darcy, where where are you ranking it? Because uh, Luke just gave it five stars. <laughs> it was interesting. Um, People, people talked about it, you know, afterwards, which I think is, uh, is what they were looking for. So I, I, enjoyed, uh, I enjoyed all the character coming up in that video. <laughs> um, uh, Joe, anything about the video? How many stars are you giving it? Because Darcy didn't put a star number on it. So we're left to wonder, but do you want to put a star number on it? Um, well, I think it sums up Heinrich's and uh, Johnny's relationship perfectly. Great there. Uh, some great top water footage top water strike the the, the not fish, just great you know, epic oh my gosh it's it's unreal that fish uh the slow motion head shakes on the surface great footage everything else that great. goes with it you know i'm not i'm not super into it it's pretty entertaining uh i know heinrich and uh johnny they get along together great so, so the, the video we're talking about, guys, Google bone saw. I'm sure that's all you will need. Maybe type bone saw musky and do not type boner saw. Uh, <laughs> type bone saw musky. Uh, you guys all know Jay Siemens, very tight friend, uh, Uncut Angling Channel. Produced the video for Dad's in Blade Baits, so it's got Jay Siemens mastery written all over it, especially with the amazing shots. There's a shot from uh, aerial drone of a musky swimming out of a tree to eat a top water well, to eat that top water bait, I guess, not a top water bait. I forgot about that. That yeah. part is amazing. Yeah. I, so, that, I mean, that along with the other with the other fish, I mean, those are two unreal shots. So we're talking about 30 or 40 seconds of the video. Uh, luckily for you, the video is like about seven minutes long. So you got <laughs> some other doozy elements to it that'll definitely leave you wondering what you just watched. And uh, certainly unlike any other fishing promos that we've seen, which is why it is definitely newsworthy, uh, regardless of whether you give it five stars or uh, are reluctant to say how many stars you give it <laughs> um you guys all want to go to bed you, you want me to hit you yeah. with some yes, yes please yes please uh, oh, can i be excused i need to go to bed yes what time's your alarm set for darcy 4 a.m 
oh, you can't get up without an alarm, so you need an alarm. <laughs> yeah. Not motivated. Yeah, not at that time. <laughs> need an alarm for that time. <laughs> okay, you can peel out whatever you want, Jerry. I'll, I'll be heading out in about an hour and 40 minutes. Oh, I no, should. just kidding. I'm not. Kidding. I'll be doing about 10, 15 tomorrow morning. Probably. Guys, all Darcy's social media phone numbers to book him as a guide. If you're interested on Lake of the Woods out of Kenora, it was going to be in the description. Um, I'm sure you can just type in Darcy Cox, Tank Industries, anywhere online. You'll you'll be led to him. So if Darcy peels out, then he's gone. Um, Luke, are you you want to go? Are you want me to hit you with any other questions or what? Um, I have. You can ask me another question or so. I feel bad that I've only been off like half of this because my reception's been so bad. I'm not giving you the full payment, that's for sure. <laughs> okay, wait I'm a minute. Here, wait, there was a payment? <laughs> he the got top, it for free, Joe. The top guys are getting paid, yeah. Oh, all right, all right. That's fine. I'm cool with that. Uh, Luke's gone again. Joe, in case <clears throat> you're all of a sudden the only last man standing here. Um, no, I'm – Are you all, Darcy? Hey, yeah, see you I'm out. Everybody. I'm out. See you guys later. Thank you for having me. Good luck, Darcy. Talk to you later. Bye bye. Yeah, good good luck, luck, man. To welcome you back again. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Bye. See ya. Um, so Joe. Yo, yo, yo. Hey, uh, just to, to, to go back to uh girths and, and uh epic size, people love talking about the biggest fish in the lake, of course, and, and whatnot. What did you you didn't have a girth on Bree's fish, right? No, I didn't. No. It was a very healthy fish. It was heavy. Okay. But, um, uh, and uh, on it, uh, to be honest, I <clears throat> I've girthed very few muskies, very nice. few. Nice. You know what? It's it's nice and refreshing for you to say that because uh, I find that most anglers, whether they're a guide or not, I don't know what, if that matters or not, but a lot of people would be reluctant to admit how few actual fish that they've weighed, whether it's walleyes they've weighed, bass they've weighed, uh, you know, fish that they've girthed in general. Because I think the reality is for a lot of us, unless weighing your fish is the primary uh way to measure fish a lot of us are rarely doing that and then and then when you get to places where they always weigh the fish then they're rarely measuring the fish right we aren't yeah. often doing a thorough job of getting all the dimensions it seems like well and and when you're concerned about the well-being of the fish it might not always be in your best interest to get all the dimensions um but but <clears throat> i mean I definitely, uh, you know, as far as weighing a muskie goes, I think a lot of times that is a little bit tougher to do. Um, I'm going to try and be a little better this season about uh, getting some girths on fish just to have an idea, especially the 48 plus inchers. Um, <clears throat> but um, uh, yeah, like I said, as far as weighing them, that's, it seems like it's a bit of a process um, unless it's a, uh, record breaking fish i don't plan on on uh trying to get a weight out of, out of it uh luke i know you fish on malax for part of your season where uh it seems like they're always uh threatening that the world record's been beaten or going to be beaten and uh what are your thoughts on the actual weights there i realize that very few if any of these fish have been actually weighed why is it we can't get a weight out of these fish, and we are stuck dealing with speculation every single freaking season. Can you can you weigh in on that? Um, I would say that the I don't know the the biggest reason why you haven't seen anything that's been weighed is that a lot you know obviously a lot of them are they're being released because we have an amazing catch and release ethic down there, um, even with some of those really really giant fish. But uh, I mean it just there's we maybe only have had two fish out of the we've made just surpassed our state record, um, which only is 54 two. pounds even. 54? So, yeah, it's, uh, our state record is 54 pounds even. So I'm, there's maybe only been one or two of those fish that potentially surpassed that. Um, I think everybody down there has got a – everybody fishing there that's really serious has a pretty good idea of what they're handling. So you so, have I mean, – Sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry about that. It's oh, funny. Are you gone, Luke? So, Joe, I'm I'm guessing that where he's going with this is you do have to basically kill it to get a proper measurement, which is why they're reluctant to do it. Is that what you're guessing? Um, I guess, yeah. I mean, um, I don't know if he was really saying that necessarily, but it, I think that it's not – 
I think maybe for the same reason that I don't get uh, weight out of it a lot. I don't, I don't think a lot of guys have a scale that can, you know, a lot of guys don't have a 60 pound scale fish scale on the boat. I think a lot of fish scales aren't, aren't graded for that much. And, and then you gotta, you know, you probably got to weigh the net and everything when you're weighing the fish um, to do it. If you really, if you really want to take care of the fish, you kind of want to cradle it while you're weighing it. So, so, I don't know. I think that's, I think, I think with muskies, that's a big part of the reason why a lot of them aren't weighed. And the only ones that do get weighed are the ones that come in to get put on the wall. Um, so the problem I'm seeing here is that we're never weighing them as musky anglers. We have no practice weighing them. We're often not carrying scales. And even if we are carrying a scale, we aren't ready or prepared to weigh this fish because we never do it. So suddenly it's like, how am I going to weigh it? It's the net or not, right? Yeah, it's like that, you know, a moment of panic because you haven't practiced. You've never done it before, and you're like, how am I going to do this? You okay. Know? And then a lot of people feel, uh, I, it's almost like, for, I shouldn't say a lot of people, but for some anglers, it's like panic kind of sets in when they have a fish in the bag, and they, they're kind of so worried about getting this fish back ASAP. I see, I've seen it before where, you know, um, I know I know a, a couple on Lake of the Woods here that fishes with me that... Uh, um the the wife got the her personal best musky the boat was blowing into the rocks um and they put the fish back without getting a picture of it because because they were you know they were panicked and because they were so concerned about getting the fish back right away what caliber of fish was this though it was about a 46 incher i believe they got a measurement but no picture okay okay so like so you not know a giant but her personal best and they've put they put a, a good amount of time into musky fishing, not just on Lake of the Woods, but other places. So okay. it was a fish that I, she, that both of them, I'm sure, wanted to have a record of, of really badly. But, um, you know, and I feel, and, and maybe it's just more practice with fish too, but that, it, that when you have a, a musky in the bag, you can probably steer the boat away from some rocks that are getting blown towards or something like that, you know, um, as long as the water isn't 80 degrees or something that you can, you can take care of the boat, make sure you're not going to sink the boat on some rocks. Yeah. You don't okay. have to panic about getting the fish back. Okay. We're going to go on this topic just a little bit longer. I don't want to talk about 46 inches anymore though, as examples. Oh, sorry. Yeah. 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 Cause we're talking about those really big fish and the speculation of how big they were, you know, getting one of the measurements, not all the measurements and typically wanting to release it and not getting the weight or appropriate. What I want to suggest is a weighing option. I can't remember if we discussed this or not, but this is an idea I got from Ryan Marlowe of Kenora Muskie fame circa a decade ago. And now we're all left wondering where Ryan Marlowe is and we hope he's well where he is. I see him just at random times. I'll be fishing in the big narrows and he comes by in a boat. Fishing? Happy? Happy, fishing, sometimes just cruising. Last time I was with a boat full of clients and he drives by and yells out, Hey, it's Joe Cooper, the coolest gay guy I know. <laughs> that's, so, you know, yeah, that's, that's Marlo for you. It sounds like, Ryan, just the right amount of tact. Yes. Um, so this is an idea I did get from Ryan, and it's an idea Ryan always talked about, and I don't know if he's ever followed through with it, but as soon as he told me about it, I followed through with it immediately. And his idea was carry a bathroom scale with you and just carry that fish right onto the bathroom scale. At least you got something rough. At least. Why is that rough? rough? Well, I mean, okay. Well, it's you're not going to have the exact to the tenth, to the tenth pounds or anything like that, especially if you're in waves and stuff. That's a good point because, like, for a lot of records, like IGFA records, like weight records, not length records, they don't count unless you bring the fish to shore because a boat moving is not a certified, verified weight. Okay, so good mm -hmm. point. But let's pretend that it's either calm, so it's good enough for us. We're not necessarily looking to verify it. We just want to get a good yeah. one. Or that we're close enough that we can beach the boat on shore and stop the movement of the boat, okay? Having, having a bathroom scale on the boat, that's absolutely the best way to do it. And let me tell you, because I have carried this with me, musky fishing and sturgeon fishing all the time. I've still yet to use it, but I do play with it. I do keep the batteries warm inside my chest pocket all the time. Um, and I will use it at some point. What I was going to say about it, though, is that... I practice using it and I get on it like with all my clothes, whatever I'm wearing, whatever's in my pockets. And I'm, let's say I'm uh, a svelte 189 pounds of mostly muscle and mean. I'm, yeah, let's let's say it's 189 beard. pounds. Or, do you say fear? No, beard. 
beard. That's uh, too much weight. Yeah, anyway, let's, sorry. Say it, let's say it says 189.4. Okay. Mm -hmm. I turn the digital scale off. There's just a standard $25 Walmart digital bathroom scale. I turn the scale off, take the battery out, put the battery back in. I'm still wearing the same. Walk around the boat, but don't lose any weight. Not that much walking. Get back on the scale. I'm 189.4. So, so even if I'm not actually that, like in terms of accuracy, the precision shows that that number is accurate enough to consider it yeah. a zero the scale. Consist right. The consistency. Yeah. Yeah. So now, when I carry that musky onto the scale, right, that is going to be bang on. And for how rough all our estimates of musky weights are. I don't even care if that's only accurate to within one pound. I would rather know for sure my muskie is 55 pounds and it could be one pound off, half a pound off, than to know nothing about it and left to speculate for the rest of my life. Because the reality of it is when we get these weird lengths and girths that we don't know how it was measured and girth yeah. is a weird thing. There can be air swollen up in a swim bladder that really affects the girth and what the actual weight of a fish is. Absolutely. We, we're left guessing within like 15 pounds. We're not, or 20 pounds. We're not even close with our guesses. We have no clue. Hey, the bathroom weight scale thing, that's, yeah, that is carry one? great. I'm going to do it. I think I'm going to do that because it's, it's simple. That's, yeah, very simple. And um, even even if it's not maybe the most scientifically accurate measurement, it's, it's very accurate. And uh, it's way better than just throwing a number out there. And I think uh, I think one thing is people probably realize how tough it is to actually catch a thirty pound muskie or a forty pound muskie mm -hmm. um, if they actually if it's just tougher. And boy, the bathroom scale. I mean, wow, that's I can't believe uh, can't believe that isn't uh, like a more used technique. That's a great idea. I can't believe Ryan Marlowe went into the caves with Osama before sharing that with the world. <laughs> There's a lot of things he probably uh, needs to share with us, I think, you know. There's always... I think he had, what, like, something like 17 or 1850s in one year himself. So, I, I don't know he's if probably got a couple of secrets that he could share. I do know that when he ran figure eight baits and he would catch a big fish, he would often put a sticker of a figure eight baits thing on the closest buoy or nearby the spots that he had caught his 50s, like, kind of marking his territory all over the lake. Yeah. Did, you ever see that? Were you already there? With a figure. There, oh, yeah. There's a lot of buoys with figure eight bait stickers on them. Yep. And were from, they good from the northwest angle all the way to Kanara and everywhere in between? Were they musky, like good fishing spots? Oh, absolutely. Some of the best spots on the lake, no doubt. So, what I can't stand, and I'm going to bring this up in the, uh, I could bring it up in a bunch of examples because there are certainly so many examples, like we were talking about with Luke before he vanished every year. And that is like, fish that we don't have the full dimensions on then we're left to guess but it seems like the guesses attached to these fish end up carrying more i'm gonna say weight but i don't mean actual weight i mean they carry more value and momentum than the actual measurements we know do you know what i'm like sort of referring to oh absolutely yeah, yeah um you know it's it's uh uh, it's it's the whole thing with with getting a fish verified when you're going to claim if if you have the opportunity to verify it uh and you're going to claim these weights or measurements stuff like that and uh, um why you know why not have the fish verified by credible sources if oh. if well, because usually credible sources aren't available but okay so in terms of the one specific fish i think we might be both hinting at here last fall <laughs> i think his name was jeff anderson i'm not mentioning his name for any sort of like mudding reasons here because it's like you know nobody knows exactly what the details are here everything could be 100 percent legit everything he's saying could be 100 yeah. but jeff anderson caught a muskie that he uh the measurements he gave he was legally allowed to keep it which is over 54 inches so he did keep it i can't remember was it 54 55 56 somewhere in that range i believe it was 56 56 by 29 i okay. think is, is what what the measurements were 56 by 29 okay so i'm gonna just open another window here and run the formula unless somebody in the comment box can beat me to it and i i believe i believe he said that he weighed that fish on a bathroom scale but at home because he actually kept the fish yeah the fish was kept. Um, uh, he weighed that fish on a bathroom scale. He claimed it in at 61 pounds. And uh, What did he say it was? 
He said on the bathroom scale, it was 61, 61 pounds. 61 pounds. Okay, so I got over here on OutdoorsFirst.com, uh, your number one source for all musky fishing. Looks like they've got forums and stuff. You can check out musky first, OutdoorsFirst, musky.com, whatever this is. Uh, they got a formula here, so I'm going to type in. For worth, best we can remember is 56 by 29, right? Yep. 29-inch girth, which is, as you remember earlier, that's bigger than any <laughs> That, that, that formula puts it at this formula anyways i don't know if this is the only one but it puts it at 59 pounds which is right on the realm of what he is suggesting it weighed so now mm -hmm. we've got a dead fish and we've got a real weight which is extremely rare that a real weight is even offered right yeah so from the best of your recollection uh recollection what's the issue then like it feels like there's a dead fish there's measurements being provided. We're not left to guess. And there's a weight provided. And the weight checks out with the formula that I just ran the numbers with. So what was the controversy? Well, I, I think just a fish like that, a fish of that caliber deserves to be, uh, to be verified by other sources and, and credible sources. And um, I think Jeff... Uh, chose not to have the fish verified just because uh I, I think partly maybe he was a little afraid that um the measurements or measurements after the fish had been frozen um maybe they wouldn't match up with what he said i think he was kind of afraid of getting put on the spot about that um i think he yeah I, you know i'm not i'm not 100 percent sure in, in what why the fish wasn't verified but okay so I can appreciate that not everybody wants to be on the cover of the newspaper when they do something amazing. And maybe that's Jeff Anderson. So um, maybe we can sort of walk in his shoes and imagine like, why does he need the world and other people to verify this fish? Because he's got all the measurements. He's got all the information he needs, right? That's kind of where Jeff might yeah. be looking at it. Um, and I guess, I guess maybe this is what you're hinting at, but the reason that there's some unrest here is that what the numbers indicate is basically the heaviest muskie ever documented on Lake of the Woods, right? Absolutely. And Absolutely. And then not only that, but, um, but also just the debate itself. Does a 60-pound muskie exist on Lake of the Woods? That's been a debate that has brought up. It's, it's been brought up in numerous locations. And it seems to be that people either strongly agree or strongly disagree. There's nobody who's really in between. And that fish would have been kind of the fish to settle that argument. And the fact that, uh, you know, it never really got that verification to settle the argument. Yeah. Um, was a little, little disappointing. And to elaborate on that, we're not just talking about does a 60 pound muskie swim in Lake of the Woods. We're talking about does a 60 pound muskie swim on planet Earth right now? And yes, yes, does it? does it answer the question? Does a 60 pound muskie swim out there somewhere? Yes, 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 absolutely, absolutely. And then the next question is, is Lake of the Woods capable of producing that fish? And uh, and my opinion is yes. Yes. And yes are like are we lucky uh likely to ever see this fish because like my the opinion that i like to go to bed believing is that the biggest fish in a lake will never be caught it's just a little bit more securing to me because if the biggest fish is uncovered it feels like there's no more treasures to seek i don't want that to ever be the case i don't want to find out this was the biggest fish in the lake i want it to be yeah. forever uncaught yeah yeah and that's you know and in a way the biggest fish in the lake will be forever uncaught because even even when that 60 pounder does get caught it just makes you think wow you know i wasn't sure if there was a 60 maybe uh you know maybe there's a 65 or whatever so does the biggest fish in the lake ever get caught i don't know but do you believe that the biggest fish in the lake's name is jingle bells because it has multiple lures hanging out of its face no no you believe it no. it has avoided lures altogether because it is uncanny <sighs> how um a fish that is 15 percent bigger is uh, four hundred percent more likely to get away. Yeah. Well, and here, here's my opinion on Lake of the Woods and the biggest muskie in Lake of the Woods. Um, you look at a lot of these giants that get caught in other lakes, 
and mainly what I'm talking about when I say other lakes, I guess it would be like Minnesota lakes. Uh, for an example, a lot of those fish that get caught out there in those Minnesota lakes are open water fish, Mille Lacs. Um, uh, they're, they're caught in the basin. They're not caught on structure. They're caught fishing over deep water mm -hmm. around bait fish. And, um, I think that's a tactic that is very rarely used on Lake of the Woods. I think it's probably pretty overwhelming due to the fact that the the open water on Lake of the Woods is just so extensive. Like it's, there's no way that in a lifetime you could even make a dent in it. So um, I kind of feel like, you know, that, that biggest muskie is out there, you know, chasing bait fish in the basin somewhere. And the only way anybody's ever going to come in contact with it, with it is if they're spending a lot of time out there with days, days and weeks of no fish caught, no fish mm -hmm. seen because they're looking for the one. And, and, uh, and it's going to, you know, how many fish are they going to catch before they actually find that one? Cause there is a good number of fish out there in the middle of nowhere. Um, so Hey, what about when that fish is in a bay, the same fish is in a bay tomorrow? Can you tell the viewers why that won't be the same fish you're talking about, even though it is the same fish you're talking about? If you know what I'm saying? Um, yeah, yeah. No, I guess I, I see what you're talking about. Like that, you're saying that that fish that's out in the open water ha has to come in and spawn at some point, you're saying. Yeah. yeah. And so it's got to be close to structure at some point. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah, I guess that would be one time where maybe you could run into it. Although, uh, I think a giant female spawning, um, that's probably going to be a tough fish to catch. That's, you know, that fish is, you know, you might get a look at it, but to get hooks in it, it is a different story, especially after it's, it's stressed itself out spawning and, uh, and, and stuff like that. And then it's not the same fish, right? Yeah. That's yeah. right. And it's not 60 pounds anymore. It's not 60 pounds. It might be that, that 56 or 57, but. Inch, you mean? Yeah. 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 So, yeah, that, a lot of people don't realize that the exact same fish that is going to be 55 pounds in the fall or could be 55 pounds in the fall is legitimately like 38 pounds or 40 pounds. I'm, I'm yeah. guessing that's accurate, you know? Who knows? It, but it would be hugely different in weight the amount of weight that the fish puts on and everybody has seen uh whether it's a walleye or whatever you're fishing for right now you're talking about a 30 inch walleye that could weigh six and a half pounds and that same 30 inch walleye could weigh 11 or 12 pounds almost double the weight come yeah. September. so it's the same yeah. thing with muskies it's it's exponential okay joe uh wrapping up sort of here but uh how busy are you if i wanted to go fishing with you in the northwest angle on lake of the woods what are my options do you have any dates this year because I know, oh, pretty, just, to, just let me finish my sentence, actually. Don't interrupt. Uh, I noticed that Luke said uh, he's fully booked this year. You can still call up Luke and try and book a trip. But Luke's fully booked. Are you fully booked? I'm not fully booked. I got a few days here and there. Okay. Um, when about? Um, I, I could, I'd have to, can you still hear me here? I, got, I can look at my calendar. You could hit us with the abouts because people are going to contact you and, and figure out exact dates. I mean, it's, um, I'm looking at like some early, uh, there's a few days early July that I have open and a few yeah. days early August that I have open. And, oh, so you're busy, busiest in the fall? Um, well, I, uh, I would love to fill my October up. Okay. October is a month that, uh, that I, I get some days early on and, um, you know, the first week of October I'm booked, but after that is wide open. Fishing is great. Uh, right up until it freezes for for muskies and for all other fish too. So um, if anybody would want to come up and and you know experience Lake of the Woods in fall, it's beautiful and the fishing is great and I would love it. So experience that'd be a great time. And experience Joe Cooper, right? And experience Joe Cooper, right there. Um. Okay, so what am I going to put in the – I'm going to put your phone number or your social medias or what's going to be the best place for people to contact you? Uh, yeah, may, uh, phone number and email. I'll get you I'll get you put that stuff up. Um, you know, where I live at here, it's poor service, but I usually get back to guys at the end of the day about fishing and um, email is also a great way to get back to me. Guys and girls, yes, because – Guys and girls, cheerleaders, 
whatever. Not cheerleaders, but we do live in a world where we've got uh, some awesome up and coming female anglers, much the same as up and coming male anglers, because everybody's enjoying the sport. Absolutely, you're right, Aaron. You're absolutely um, right, Aaron. Um, I think we're done. I'm going to read the comment box. Maybe I'll answer a couple questions on our way out. Uh, yep. New Mexico trout. You don't read the comments, do you? But I'm reading the comments, Kyle Wurgler. Wurgler. If, I mean, it's a great last name because it sounds like a streamer fly of some sort. Uh, not really much for questions coming in here. So, uh, I, I didn't get to look at the comments while all this was going on. Um, but... I read plan on going in. through them after it's over, so if that's worth anything. Joe's going to read every comment, guys. I read all the comments, and I take them all to heart. Please be gentle. Okay, hold on. Here's some good qu qu uh, comments. Okay, tell us about the damn Easter egg. Guys, someone did guess the Easter egg. I don't know if I'm going to do a video to fully uh, explain it, but somebody did figure out the Easter egg. If you go read, it's one of the top comments. I did send them a pair of uh, FXR polarized sunglasses. Can't remember the guy's name. But uh, it's in the comments. You will see. He figured it out. It's amazing. Um, hold on. They're coming in hot now. Uh, uh, mustache about bugs. Bullhead fishing is king. Why does Laz talk with a lisp? That is a very interesting question. Uh, why does he talk with a lisp? You know what I find interesting about that is that people would typically um, tease somebody that might have a lisp. And it just, like, it shows how fishing breaks through so many boundaries in that sense. Because Laz, there, this person, whoever mentioned Laz, Ryan, I think, um, Laz is considered like on this pedestal for musky fishing, Mike Lazarus. And everybody's like, who's the best basketball player in the world? And it's like, okay, well, it's uh, LeBron James. I had to go show it to LeBron. Well, who's the best musky fisherman? And it's like, it's for sure Mike Lazarus. And then we can debate second, but it's for sure Mike Lazarus. Okay, so he's on this pedestal and he, he has the utmost amount of respect for him, even though... He's like, he talks pretty funny. If you've ever seen him on Musky Hunter, he's hard to understand. And he's like, just always rattling off these little zippy one-liners and stuff. But what I'm getting at is he's got like so much respect for him, which just shows how you're like out in the real world. You're not in high school where Joe and I used to get bullied anymore. So much bullied, dude. What, you have a good bullying story? <clears throat> I actually got a swirly. I really did, like, uh, they really did stick my head in the toilet and flush it. And I went back into the math class to explain what had happened, and not even the teacher would believe me. <laughs> was it older kids or just bigger kids in the same grade? Just bigger kids, same grade as me. His name was Mike. Gosh, yeah. Sorry. Mike. Mike's praying in the comment box right now. Okay, so let's put this in perspective. This was in grade 10? Um, seven or eight, I'd say. So Joe's from like uh, Bidette, right? Bidette. Bidette, yeah. Minnesota. Shout out. Um, so this Mike would still be around four years later when you're in grade 11, five years later when you're in grade 12, and potentially six, seven, eight years later when you're out of high school. When is there ever any sort of resolution to this bullying? Because bullying is such a real issue with kids these days. So like what happens? It sounds like, like you're a pretty secure guy, so you could maybe handle it. But like what happens to like move on from this? Um, you know, I think it didn't, it didn't really phase me too much, you know, because I didn't really have a lot of friends and he was probably one of them. So I just needed to, you know, keep rolling with him. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I don't know. You know, I, uh, um, did he ever say sorry? Was it ever acknowledged or no, no, definitely not. No, I just, you know, I just move on. I think that's how I, that's how I was able to combat stuff like that is I didn't let it bug me and I just was like, you know what, if you want to book drop me and kick all my assignments all the way down the hallway and so I have to pick up every single one of them, I'll do it. I don't care because the senior girls love me even when I'm in seventh grade. That's, that's how when, it was. I gave them you, back rod. When did you back stop getting bullied? What grade? Uh, when I graduated, when I was done with school. Really? It took that long. Okay, well, so you, you're you just saying that uh, you kind of kept uh, – tried not to let it bother you. I don't know if that's the best advice because – I don't want to compare your bullying necessarily to some people who are severely bullied because it sounds like you weren't, I don't want to minimize your bullying, but I mean, it's just one. Well, no, I wasn't really bullied, but I mean, I, I made it so that I wasn't really bullied, but maybe sometimes I was actually bullied, but you know, I felt like for myself, I was pretty good at just, just, you know, just water under the bridge mm -hmm. or whatever, if you know, when in Rome. 
Okay, so what I want to, like, maybe a suggestion for kids, like I know there's a lot of younger audience on YouTube, especially watching us babble on here at 11 o'clock. Um, potentially the internet is a place where you are going to receive more bullying, but the internet, I'm not suggesting go to like the deep dark corners of the internet, but uh, social media and opportunities that, like that does give you the opportunity to branch out and connect with other people outside of your tight friend groups where maybe you're in grade 10 and it looks like the whole world's against you, but there is like, a bigger world out there. And if you have a, an interest, probably fishing, if you're actually watching this, right? Um, if you like fishing, there are people that want to connect with you that like fishing too. And suddenly, suddenly the bullying is, you know, Mike Lazarus is, is lisp is not a concern in the fishing world because all that we have in common is fishing and that is all that matters. So, you know, connect with I've other- I've gone on fishing trips. I've gone on fishing trips to Eagle Lake with groups of guys anywhere from 18 years old to 55 years old and guys, you know, who are sober guys who aren't sober, whatever it is, like maybe guys that I probably never would have even talked to. Yeah. Um, if it wasn't for fishing and we had a great time together, you know, and I, I'll never forget one time on Eagle Lake with Ryan Marlowe and, uh, and another, another buddy uh, says, you know, that guy's goofy we're talking about somebody else and he goes that guy's goofy and ryan says look at us we're all goofy and we all had a good laugh because he's right we are all we're all goofy yeah yeah so it's uh you're absolutely right you know it just uh the having fishing in common and uh being able to go out there and enjoy it out on the water can bring all kinds of people together just messaging people on facebook somebody that you've never even met uh, before you might message them to see if they want to go fishing and you end up becoming great friends. Yeah. So, so kids like reach outside of your classroom, like, like embrace your hobby and make it your own, find other people that you, you can fish with and don't be you see, inside those cement walls where the issue is because the world is so much bigger than that. And as soon as you hit grade 12, you're going to see that immediately. So if you're feeling like it's years away, you can start embracing it anytime. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. You're absolutely right, Aaron. And also, kids, don't forget to get all your measurements as well. You know, girth, length, weight. Bathroom scale. The bathroom scale. Bring it all. Uh, Hendak Moon, I talked about the sharpshooting eager up, eager Easter egg update. Go look at that video. The, uh, the answer was figured out in the most recent uh, comments there. The prize was sent out. People are um, concerned about that Easter egg. They're really concerned. It was, it was a small horse while the topic of horsing fish in that showed up on the screen. And the guy who found it said that he paused the screen to go to the washroom and he'd watched this video. I can't remember if he said hundreds of times or dozens of times, but he paused like a 14 minute video randomly to go use the restroom. He comes back to sit down probably with a soda or something and just like takes his time pressing the play button and looks up on the screen. And there it is in that instant that it flashes for a little tiny spot, the horse that's paused on the screen. And that's how he sees it. That's unbelievable. He had him to put and a lot of the hype had died down. People weren't guessing anymore. A lot of the hype had died down. So it felt like it was never going to be discovered. And just so you guys know, if there's anybody really following this, uh, it might seem like such an obscure thing. And it's like, that's oh, so hard. I mean, how are we supposed to find that? The challenge with it is, is if you make it this much easier, a thousand people find it. So you have to make it, you have to find that very difficult level where it is difficult to find. And I don't know how to gauge that because I don't know if I made it last on the screen a little bit longer, show up a little bigger. It might've been seen in the very first person that watches it. We're all, we all have the same eyes, the same response time. So... We're, all, we're probably all going to see it, or we're all not going to see it. So it's a really hard little amount of people to hit. Aaron, well, you're just, what's you weren't planning on actually having to give out a prize. You know, That's another yeah, Let's all be real here. Let's all be real. Um, that's a joke. I know that's probably why people are uh, kind of getting on your case about it. They probably feel like, you know, there was no finish to it, and you just kind of got, it was like a clickbait type thing or something, but... That's probably why they're getting after you, but I'm glad you that you're clearing that up. I love my type of guy. Hey, Joe, did you say uh, Smoke Eater wants to know Smoke Eater, Smoke Eater, Smoke Eater wants to know if you said water under the fridge on purpose? Water under the fridge. Okay. Uh, Mad props to Joe for staying up this late. Says Jake Siebold. Uh, 
Joe, what time is your alarm going to be set for? Or what time are you going to be getting out of bed to go musky fishing tomorrow? No, I don't have a real early time. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to probably get to the boat about six just so that I can go out. I got to set some line on some reels and uh, some stuff like that, but we're not going to be actually heading out fishing until probably about eight. So. Um, interesting. Okay. Uh, I don't know if there's any other questions here. Am I going to the same Paul I show? I don't know if I'm going to the same Paul I show Calvin Grosvenor, but I heard that there is a Fargo Moorhead ice fishing show for the first time this year. And it's going to be held within a week of the same Paul ice fishing show. And I'm M tentatively, this isn't an announcement. I'm tentatively planning to go probably going to drag Joe along with me. Uh, it's probably in November when I got nothing yeah. going on. I'm definitely not guiding. Joe's season won't be started. He's not going to be guiding. So anyways, good chance I will be in Fargo. It is closer to me. It is a new, exciting show. So uh, stay tuned for more details on that. You can probably already Google some detail. Um, oh, Kyle Wer Wergler caught a 25-inch walleye last weekend, 25 and a half. I hope it was on a fly called a Wergler. Aw. Aw, Miss Princess Paulina, who's one prize before, says the problem with the Easter egg hunt is that we have no clue what we're looking for. At least in a real egg hunt, we know we're looking for an egg. Ooh, that is deep. Okay, let me explain this to you, Miss Princess Paulina, because there isn't a specific definition for this. Because I'm calling it an Easter egg, it's for sure not going to be an Easter egg. It's resembling an Easter egg. And what is an Easter egg? Something that doesn't belong in your house, but it is hidden, and the intention is that you will find it, you will uncover it, okay? So when I put a horse randomly edited into the clip, it doesn't belong. The intention is that someone will see it, wonder why it's there, point it out, win a prize. So I believe that it does qualify and does make sense. I think you probably will agree after I explain it maybe a little bit more clearly in that sense. You aren't supposed to know what you're looking for necessarily because it isn't going to be an exact Easter egg. It's like an Easter egg. Uh, Joe Cooper, this is Ryan. Mm, I'm going to take a stab at this unless you, you want to take a stab at it. I don't have, I can't see it. I don't know where we're okay. at here. Ryan said, Ryan McKittishan says Joe Cooper caught his 50 with Ryan Marlowe, and he mentions a specific spot that I'm not going to read out loud. That could be, yeah. I, I'm, <clears throat> I'll say it was like right in town. Do you want right? to say, he says the type of structure and the exact spot. Do you want to say it? Did he say it was on a tree? Tree in? Uh, right near... Uh, um, is there a painted rock? I don't even, yeah, by, by that one painted rock there. And the tree has since floated away after that year. How did he know that? Why is he so concerned about where I caught my fish? I don't know this. I had my GPS. I probably had my GPS feature on the picture. Uh, I think he knows Ryan. He's making a lot of Ryan Marlowe comments. Uh, 20 questions game. I don't know that game. All we know is fishing. Keep that in mind, j Dog. Ryan Marlowe right now. Probably is Ryan Marlowe. Uh, okay, here's a good question. A very specific to Lake of the Woods question. Dan Diedrich is wondering, Joe... Why does separation point suck? It looks so sexy on Lake of the Woods, and I should be able to look at a map and pick out a good musky spot because usually it makes sense. So, first of all, does separation point suck, Joe, and why does it suck if it does? Well, I wouldn't say it sucks. Uh, <clears throat> what I would say is I probably don't fish all those, those big rocks off the tip of the point as much as I fish the cabbage at the base of the point. Oh, I wonder if Dan knows about the cabbage at the base of the point. That's all I'm going to say. Okay. Nice little Easter egg. Oh. Um, more people are talking about night fishing. Do you guys musky, um, fish muskies after sunset? What are your thoughts on fishing after dark, says Chris Sawatsky to uh, you, Joe? Fishing after dark on Lake of the Woods? Yeah, sure. Like, Do you fish after dark, and what are your thoughts mm -hmm. on it, whether you do or don't? I fish, I have very rarely fished into the darkness. I've fished maybe an hour or two after sunset. Ever? Quite a few times. Okay, quite a few times. Quite a few times. <clears throat> an hour or two after sunset. But as far as like um, going in, you know, into that, uh, like what Minnesotans would consider night fishing, I just, I haven't had any luck on that, like on Lake of the Woods. 
And I've tried it a few times. Probably not enough times to have an accurate uh, test, but when you can catch fish all day long, <clears throat> it's a dangerous lake to be out on at night. Um, you might know where all the rocks are, and really you don't know where all the rocks are, but you might think you know where all the rocks are, but that doesn't account for any floating logs or uh, maybe parts of a dock or something that has floated away. Driving around on this lake at night, uh, there's no cell phone service. There's nobody else out there. And if you end up uh, making a mistake, it can be very costly. So it's safe. You, big, big concern. It sounds like safety. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can catch fish all day long on Lake of the Woods. I think uh, the reason for night fishing most of the time is because you can't catch them during the day. So, okay. So Joe's thoughts to summarize that is that musky fishing at night is good, but so is musky fishing in the day. So I'm not going to fumble around and deal with the safety issues. That's what he's saying, Chris. So basically, don't be discouraged from fishing at night from a success standpoint. You have uh, just as good of a chance, maybe better, Joe's saying, of catching them at night, but it isn't necessary and it will drive you crazy. Yeah. A um, couple more questions here. Joe, do you want to go? Am I keeping you up late? No, I'm good. I, this is my life, man. I love you guys. Um, I don't know if I missed a couple here. Okay. Peter S. Benson says, want to do a walleye tournament with me, Aaron? I'm going to say no, Peter. I don't know you. If I, I like, I fish with, just to put in respect, I fish with my dad hopefully once a year, but not necessarily. So it's nothing against you. But if I get a chance to fish a tournament, I'm going to try and fish it with my dad or, uh, you know, one of my D one ends that I've known forever that I want to uh, spend some time with, as opposed to necessarily getting to know you no offense to you whatsoever. But I do suspect that Joe might want to fish that tournament with you. Is there any truth to that, Joe? I'm booked that day. Oh, okay. Sorry, Peter. Um, uh, more, okay, more crappie and walleye ice fishing. Night fishing is where it's at, says King's Fox. Um, my point is I might find the egg in the video and not even know it. Well, Miss Princess Paulina, if you go, uh, Miss Princess Paulina is still on this Easter egg thing. What, what, not she, because I know this is a, a, a guy, is saying is, um, what if I find the egg, and I don't even know I found it. Okay, well, if you go look at this Easter egg, you'll see that it's out of place. And my point is that it is an Easter egg because it's out of place. It's been planted on purpose. You'll see it, and once you acknowledge it, you'll see that it is out of place. It is an Easter egg. It is. It doesn't belong there. Um, Cody Francisco. Have you heard of him, Joe? Cody Francisco. Nope. He lives in Winnipeg. He wants... Uh, me or you to try one of his homemade musky baits. I don't musky fish as often as I should, Cody. So you could try to get it to me. Um, but if you could track Joe down and get convince Joe to huck some cast with it, you'll probably get a better field testing report than you will from me on the baits. And I think that Joe would actually be intrigued to look at it. I would be too, but I, I don't know if I'd get a chance to use it beyond that. Um, how many muskies have you caught? Says Brent. Fell their word. Uh, Joe, you want to tackle that in, in some degree? How many muskies have you caught ever? <clears throat> Last season was the first season that I've ever kept track of uh, the total number of fish in the boat. Um, this was from season opener till season end. It was every muskie in the boat. Uh, there was 123 that came into the boat last season. 12, 12 of those were over 48 inches. And four of those 12 were over 50 inches. And that was the first year I've ever, I've ever kept track. I know the year before uh, last, we had 18 over 48 in the boat. So I, I don't know exactly how many I've caught, but I'd like to think that uh, I might be getting close to having boated 1,000 muskies total. Okay, so Brent, interesting points there. He's keeping track of it for the boat because it is a team sport. It's not... You know, it's about, you know, some of the fish you've been a part of in that, in that sense. And I, what I find interesting there that I want to break down immediately is like like he's separated out the 48s and the 50s. So four 50s out of 125 muskies, you said roughly. So that's like one in 30 is a 50. Mm -hmm. and do you think that's accurate over the course? Like if I go catch 30 muskies, am I going to catch a 50 on the average? Or will I have to catch more or less than that to probably catch a 50? I, I think that... Um... I think that, you know, especially for an experienced musky fisherman, if it, I think you can catch a 50 in 20, every 20 fish on Lake of the Woods. I think that, um, 
you know, last season is just one season. I think that also uh, 50 inches are tough to catch. And the majority of the fish that are put in my boat are caught by clients. And, um, and uh, I think a 50 incher is a smart fish and it takes an experienced angler to, to put that fish in the boat. So to put it in the boat. And also, are you suggesting that an experienced musk angler is going to, uh, embrace the lake a little differently and maybe target fish and spots? Like, I'm, I'm not exactly sure because when you go out there, I'm assuming when you're with guests, you want to catch a musk. You don't want to target and make it more hard on yourself, a bigger one. Right. Yeah. I'm. I mean, uh, of course, I'm always just looking to get them a muskie. There's there's times, too, I'm with guests and I'm big fish fishing. I mean, it all depends on the different people. But, um, but yeah, there's the majority of the time, the objective is to catch a muskie and not, ju- and not catch a trophy muskie necessarily, but just to catch a muskie. Okay, so give us a hint, because I'm sure Brent would have a follow-up question if he could right now. Maybe he does further down. Um, if you were big fish fishing, targeting a big muskie, a lot of us, myself included, just want to catch a muskie. So now there's the added layer of targeting a big muskie. Are you talking about baits, spots? What can we do to catch a bigger muskie if we get tired of catching those pesky 45 inches? I think just as an example, if you were to take this opening weekend, for example, um, I think that out of all the muskies that get caught opening weekend in the weeds, um, the average size is generally small. And I think that there are a few big muskies that get caught on open water structure. And um, you would probably be not, you, you wouldn't be fishing very productively. You'd be, uh, you know, looking for just those uh, one or two bites in the day. But that would be, in my opinion, big fish fishing is, is looking, is targeting a different type of structure from where the majority of the fish is, because maybe you have a piece of knowledge that uh, allows you to, to target another area where you think that there's a better chance at catching a, an above average size muskie. What about baits? Is it going to be the same baits or will you be using, like, can you use a, a even bigger bait without... Possibly. I mean, um, I think you're still going to want to, you know, throw what the fish are looking for. I think early in the season, I think all muskies are generally eating smaller size meals. Oh, so it's not the time to size up for a bigger bite necessarily. Probably not this time of year, but that, at other times of year. Yeah, probably. I mean, in the fall time, um, I mean, you know, putting a big bait on is probably going to target bigger fish. They're eating big meals and, um, and it's not always necessarily big bait, big fish, but um, it's it probably holds true quite a bit. Do you want to talk about a coot or, or not really? The coot? Well, the coot um, lure, what is it? The coot lure, uh, that one, you know, is just a double blade. It's got two 10 blades hanging off the back of it. It's a piece of wood. Um, it's very unique. I've caught a lot of muskies on it. A lot of guys think it's something that you hang on the wall as a joke. Okay, so before you tell us what you've done with it, try to really break, like, look around you. Is there an object you can use to show us what it looks like? How far away would you have to go to get one? Uh, I have one right, actually, down in the car right now. I have my coot down in the car. Yeah, you go take oh, wait, how you get that. They're going to yeah, appreciate got- this, because I bet you, since I've barely heard of it, I bet you most of the people watching have not heard of a coot. All right, I got this. Is your reception going to be good? All right, can you entertain everybody for yeah. a minute? I okay. might lose you, though. Jared Kelly asked about live bait right. muskie. I might not lose you. Jared, what I would say about live bait muskie is that where we are here is uh, there's like sunset baits in Kenora that has some decent suckers sometimes, but our availability even of live bait is so limited that it kind of makes it not pursued too much here. Joe, is that accurate? Can you get suckers easily in the broken angle? Well, <clears throat> can you hear me, Aaron? Yeah, can you get suckers? That, like, Jared's asking uh, what your thoughts on live bait muskie are. Can you even get a hold of live bait to you? <clears throat> it's a northwest angle uh, across the border with live bait hey. from U.S. Reason. Joe, just, just, just uh, don't talk until you get back to your cell reception. Uh, Jared... What he was going to say is that there's it's really tough to get live bait into the Northwest Angle based on the regulations and whatnot. So uh, it sounds like it's not really something he uses that much. 
I will say that when you go to Minnesota, like another shout out to Minnesota, shout out to Wisconsin, shout out to Michigan. We love all you there. Um, oh, there is a shop in every single corner, and it is so easy to get a hold of bait in the states, whether it's choice of different kinds of minnows, whether it's live suckers, whether it's you want six inch suckers, eight inch suckers, ten inch suckers. A lot of these places have such variety, and we don't have that here. And that's one of the reasons that we just don't even dabble with it. It's not necessarily the effectiveness; it's just the availability. So it's not a big concern. Joe, just don't talk till you get better reception. Uh, okay, here's a good question. How about now, though? Get to your better How about best now, reception. Though? Are you there? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Break down exactly what this lure is, and then give us a little bit of a synopsis on what you've done with it in the past. <clears throat> this is uh, one of the four original coots that I got. I'm trying to see if I can really get a full. I mean, I got the. There's a couple of blades hanging off the back there. Some plexiglass. It's kind of a piece of wood. Joe, we don't of... see it. We don't see it. We need to. I'll stop talking, but we need oh. you to get further from the camera. Can you, like this, there we go. Can you see it now? There you go. All right, all right, good. So here we go, yeah, it's, uh, there's kind of what it looks like. Basically rides with this board just right on the surface and these blades just below the surface. And uh, um, it's just very unique. You can really slowly crank it back in so the blades are just slowly moving just below the surface, as you can see from underneath. It's a really big profile, so uh, it's like a topwater blade bait, I guess. I don't know how to explain it, but it's definitely like nothing else there is out there, and it catches fish. It's crazy. It's it's a pain to cast. It's kind of like casting a kite. Yeah. Uh, catches a lot of wind, but it's still- effective, man. It's a big profile, and it's, uh, it leaves a huge wake in the water, and there's actually a bait that has just come out this year um, that I think is going to do something very similar to the coot. This bait is called the Boiler Maker. It's made by Lee Lures. It's a single-blade bucktail with a piece of cedar on the back behind the tinsel. Um, I don't have one with me. I did order one. It's on its way, but um, that's probably the bait I'm most excited about this season is that Boilermaker. It's a little different than anything else out there right now. Yeah, we'll add the link to that at the bottom somewhere too. Shout out to Lee Lures, Lee Token, and the Boilermaker is the uh, hoot. If somebody wants to track it down, are they still made? Can someone get one of those? Because I remember when you first got those or first let me in on the secret. Now we're telling thousands of people or dozens or whoever's watching. You said like half the fish you caught on it were 48s or something at one point, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, I've uh, two 48s on the coot. Um, uh, where did it, it? It won a it won a musky tournament on Minnetonka, I think, or somewhere. There was a yeah. musky tournament where it won, but it was, um, I don't know where to fish. get it. It used to be just like cootlure.com or something, and it's like a kid in his garage that makes them. So. I don't know much about it, but... Okay, so using Google, people are probably going to still be able to track it down. Coot Lure. C-O-O-T. Just like a bird, I believe. Correct. Um, uh, Ryan suggests fish slow at night as a tip. Uh, okay, well, back to Hayden Allen. Is there a way to catch musky shore fishing? And, you know, we were talking mostly about Lake of the Woods. I can't really think about it that... I mean, I sort of think about a couple spots. It's very different. I've had, I've had guys catch muskies from shore at shore lunch. Okay, but that's not what he's asking. Because yeah. he has to use a boat to get to shore lunch. So that he just fish out of that boat instead of stopping for shore lunch. Well, I mean, yeah, but the bait isn't going the same direction and everything, so. Doesn't mean the challenge of catching it from shore. He means he wants to go catch it from shore because he doesn't have a boat. That's going to be kind of tough. So you don't have any suggestions? Uh, I mean, not in the Northwest Angle because... A lot of the shorelines around town and the access points are really gradual, so there's not a lot of musky holding structure there. So, uh, do you know of any like actually people you got you guys got to realize this? Joe is he lives in Minnesota. He's from Minnesota, so he's not actually a Canadian or from Ontario. So, Joe, do you know anything back home or anywhere in Minnesota? I should say that that someone could potentially get a musky from shore. There's got to be places. I yeah, know I've watched. I mean, I know on Lake Saint Clair, uh, they catch muskies from shore. 
Okay, there's an example. And the reason that they catch them on shore on Lake Sinclair, what I was going to suggest for some places in Minnesota, is that they're fishing in rivers. So your access points are a little bit more forgiving. You know, like there's a, a few more access points on rivers usually. So they're usually yeah. at the river mouths off the piers and stuff. They're catching them on uh, Lake St. Clair. And then on, you know, I don't want to give out any too weird of uh, areas here, but I want to say that like uh, off of the, um, what's the biggest river in Minnesota that goes through the Twin Cities? The Mississippi, right? So off of the Mississippi, a lot of the rivers that go off of there, whether it's like, can you help Saint me? St. Croix. St. Croix. St. Cloud. Fun. Is that one? That's a town, but yeah, we could do that. There's doesn't probably the, a river named St. Cloud. Doesn't the St. Cloud River flow in in St. Cloud? I'm reaching here. Let's go to the comment box. Maybe they'll know. It's all, uh, let's, you know. There's some rivers that flow into the Mississippi. Do your homework where you can catch muskies from shore. Look around. Another place to look at and target is if it's a river that you know has muskies, fish around dams because muskie like around dam below dams there's a lot going on there's current seams there's a lot of other forage there if there's muskies in a river chances are there's going to be some by a dam so there's a little tip for you because there's always access near a dam um do you, do you like that tip there's some great stuff do you guys think the 54 inch limit on lake of the woods has made a difference says miss princess paulina um joe do you want, do you want to talk about that much or just move along um I think that, uh, yeah, uh, I mean, I guess it's tough for me to say because I haven't been around. I haven't been fishing on the lake long enough, so I can't positively say. But uh, but I've heard from some guys that have fishing the lake a long time that it's as good as it's ever been. And I've heard from some guys that the muskie numbers are down. I don't think that they think the muskie numbers are down because of anglers. I think it's because of habitat. Oh, uh, I think that uh, I know a couple of senior, a couple of uh, uh, legendary guides at the angle here who believe the muskie numbers are down in Lake of the Woods because the rusty crayfish have decimated the weed growth on the lake so oh, much. That's okay. I was wondering what you meant by habitat. So that's interesting. Um, yeah. I, I got to think for Miss Princess Polina, do you think the 54 inch limit on Lake of the Woods has made a difference? So, what the, the regulations are in Lake of the Woods is that you cannot keep a muskie unless it's over 54 and they're allowing you to keep one over 54 because then you're getting to truly epic. You can keep it to measure for a world record. You can keep it for the wall. You're in that really upper one percentile. I mean, I think a lot of people would, would agree that we could just make it all catch and release because very few people keep those. And every time they keep one, there's a bunch of controversy over it anyway. So it, they don't really need to be able to keep it. I would, I would never keep a muskie unless I was fairly certain that it was a world record. And even then, I think I would have a pretty tough time uh, hauling a muskie back to the dock in the boat with me. So you really were wishy-washy on that answer. I would never do it unless maybe, like, you know. I mean, I would, I would never, even if it was 55, 56 inches, that fish is going back in the lake. But if it is uh, 59 inches and as big around as I am, um, that fish, you know, could help me retire maybe the funny thing is i think we all think we know what we do but unfortunately we'll never get the opportunity to really test ourselves on Most it likely not and i know for a fact whether i was fairly certain if it was a real record or not i would not feel good about driving back to the dock with a muskie in the boat i wouldn't feel good about it no yeah. matter what um man yeah we all are so quick to judge when people keep a muskie and they catch this epic muskie, but we definitely can't imagine, we don't know, sorry, what it would be like to do it ourselves. So it's really weird that we have an opinion on how they should have done it differently. I know that one time I catch, I, uh, I caught a walleye that was just short of 32 inches and this was on Lake of the Woods. I was fairly certain that you know, it was most probably going to be the biggest walleye I ever catch in my whole life. Um, it it was one quick picture and went right back in the lake. And you have never regretted that, I'm guessing. It sounds like. No, no. I mean that uh, it wasn't. It was a huge walleye. Like I said, might be the biggest one I ever catch, but uh, it wasn't. Uh, like I didn't. I didn't want to. There wasn't any need to melt the fish or anything like that. I didn't want to kill it. So. 
But yeah, but we're not comparing the scales again because you're talking about your fish that you just said is average massive, but we're yeah, talking yeah, yeah. About massive massive. Yeah, you're right. World yeah. record. World record. And you know what? I can't believe that we do, we won't just tell this. We won't just say that. Of course, it's made a difference because we're talking about mandatory release on all muskies, whether it's 40, 45, 50. Of course, that must be just amazing here, right? Like, why are we reluctant to say that? Yeah. I mean, it's got to be amazing. We we bitch and moan when someone keeps 154. Well, if the law was that they could keep their 45s and 40s when they felt like they should, then it would be yeah. like it would be so bad. And the reason that we can see it is that uh, Joe and other guides, document catching the same fish amongst – the guests in their boat, amongst their buddies, they document catching the same fish. So we're not talking about these hearsay stories and speculation about that fish being caught multiple times. We know for sure that fish is being caught multiple times, and we're talking about multiple times in a season. So, yes, the the, the regulations are amazing for catch and release for muskie specifically and the rewards that we reap within a single season, right? How many times do most you know of for one muskie? More than two? More than three? Or for what? Myself? Like myself? or in Anyone you know for a specific fish that they're dead certain is the same fish that's been caught multiple times. Do you know of more oh than... Oh my gosh. Like how many times in one season or... Ever. Like for one fish. What's the most... <clears throat> I know one specific fish that got caught like five times in one season. In one season? In one season. One specific fish. One specific large fish in a current channel. Uh, and, and you're sure it's the same fish? And how, what's the length? Yeah, it was right around 50 inches. I believe uh, the measurements changed after like the last two or three times. There was a pretty good damage to the tail of the fish. Okay. So what we know about that fish is that at a certain point it's going to stop getting caught because it will probably eventually die of natural causes, we'll say. We'll give it a happy mm -hmm. But what we do... What we can guess is that if it was caught five times at 50, it was probably caught a handful of times at 48, 49, a handful, well, no, never at 49, a handful of times at 47, 48, a handful of times in the mid 40s. A like that fish could have been caught. I don't know if I'm exaggerating to say 15 to 25 times in its life. Who knows? Who I mean, knows? It, it might even know uh, that getting caught is not a threat to its life. So, so the thought that you personally make a decision to take that fish out of the system, even if it is your right and it is legal where you're fishing, you, I don't want to make it sound too sad here and cold blooded what you're doing, but you're robbing 25 other memorable experiences from happening. Like that's just, it's tough. Like uh, there's a famous quote by Lee Wolf, I believe. And it's like uh, game fish is too valuable to be caught only once. And it's like, you know, uh, all spawning aside, all, uh, health of the lake and respect the fish all of that aside we're just talking about the value of that game fish the catching of that game fish is too valuable to be done only once even if it's not spawning and and making future babies just the catching of that game fish um yeah i gotta answer this fish on wants to know what's up with the ironing board i am not in my house i am in my sister and brother-in-law's house carrying keenan and, uh, I mean, like, you got to see, look at these clothes. Like, I don't know if this is Keenan who dresses this way, but like, this is some weird stuff. You guys know how fashionable I am. You want to see this for the next show? Look at that, palm trees? Like, Joe, you'd wear that. Probably no oh, pay. yeah, for sure. That's, I'm all about that right there. Um... And the reason I'm here is because I live on a farm. I don't have good internet service. So to make sure that I wasn't cutting out like Luke, I had to travel into Winnipeg to have good cell phone reception for this. Um, where did I muskies? Does Joe guide out of the Angle Outpost? Joe, what lodges do you guide out of? Yeah, Angle Outpost is, uh, is one that I guide out of. I'm an independent guide at the Northwest Angle here. So um, I guide out of all lodges at the Northwest Angle. Angle Outpost is uh, probably where one of my first recommendations is okay. on a place to stay. It's where I'm guiding at tomorrow morning. You can come to the Angle and stay wherever you want and book Joe, or you can call up Joe and Joe will help you find a place um, to stay. Absolutely. Um, Zachary Apple, I bet I bet you it's Appel. Zachary Appel says, absolutely, after dark, full moon. Um, 
Okay. And all I'll say to you, Zachary, I mean, unless, Joe, you want to give your two cents first. No, I don't doubt him one bit. Um, after dark, full moon on Lake of the Woods could be fantastic. Uh, but I guarantee uh, before dark on a full moon, I'm probably catching fish as well. And like I said, it's a Lake of the Woods is not, uh, yeah, I mean, I fish into the darkness. Don't get me wrong. I'm not but I'm not night fishing. I'm not going out there at sunset and fishing until two in the morning, three in the morning. I'm fishing, you know, from like an hour or two past sunset. So, um, and I know that's not night fishing, but Lake of the Woods is not, uh, it's definitely, even for a guy like me, it was, I've spent my entire life here and I've guided here now for, this is only my ninth summer, but I know the lake well. And uh, at night, I am. I don't feel good about being out there in a boat. I'll be That's, honest. Full well, moon's pretty bright, though. The safety difference is like way more minimal compared to a dark night, right? You're very right. Yeah, full moon, you can see the treetops. You can definitely navigate a little bit easier. But even still, you can't see that log floating in the water or sure. or something. You know, that's you might know that you're in the channel that you should be in but you can't see that dock crib that floated away from shore, you know, or whatever it is, you know? So, and you hit that thing and you get hitched out of the boat and there's not another boat coming by there for, you know, eight hours or something. So, so guys, you darn well better be wearing your life jackets. I mean, you, you should be all the time, but even I kind of get lazy. Sometimes it's a short drive in the middle of the day or whatever, but you should be all the time. If you are at night, you have to wear a life jacket, even if the water's warm, no matter what the situation, at night, you have to wear a life jacket. you got to wear your kill cord, even if it's a steering wheel boat. Put your kill cord on just to make sure you're going to kill that engine the moment you get off of the controls. Take those safety precautions. Run both your lights, okay? Uh, what else? Drive a little slower. Okay, these are stand all... Stand up. If you have a windshield boat, stand up. Stand up. Look over the windshield. You can't see through the windshield especially if you have your GPS on or dash lights on. I mean, you, I don't care what you say. You can't see. You need to be above the windshield and looking. Uh, this is so silly, but I have witnessed it happening and had it happen to myself being teased for putting both your lights in. Joe, have you ever heard that before of people teasing people? Oh, yeah. Yes. How ridiculous is that? It is absolutely mind-blowing that you get teased if you put your back light in all you need, a lot of people think, is your front light. And that drives me crazy because... And you know what? A lot of times their excuse is, is, oh, well, it makes it harder to see. It makes it harder to see. Well, you know what? What Nobody can see you, you know? Yeah. How, how does that... I mean, what does it matter if you can see when there's a boat that barrels into you, you know? Like, like I'll tell you what's cool. What's cool is being as safe as you can be. What's cool is taking control of your boat, being the captain, and demanding... Everybody puts a life jacket on. Even if you're like with, say you're with your, your great uncle and his friends and you're the lowest man on the totem pole, but you probably are the captain, especially if you're watching this video, you care enough about fishing that you're engaged with it. What's cool is to tell everybody, even the people who are older than you in seniority, to put on their life jacket. And I, I guarantee that in most scenarios, they're going to appreciate the charge you took and that you care about the safety. And typically when you're the captain, people just listen to you. They like... They get that. You, you know, you know yeah. what I mean? like the captain has that power. Yeah, absolutely. Like, be cool, be safe. That's what's cool. People disappear, especially in the night. And that's why Joe's freaking out about this. Because I, I think it was even last year specifically, three dudes go out in a boat from the Northwest Angle. Was it last year, Joe? I think it was actually a couple of years ago now. but Two years. E either way. They yeah. go out, they leave one island right in the heart of the Northwest Angle, and their plan is to go to another island that's not far away, and they One don't mile. ever make it. One mile away. So so did they get disoriented and go the other way? Did they hit a wave immediately? We don't know. Nobody will ever know. Nobody will ever know what happened because all three of them drowned. And uh, those were three – those were guides. Two of them were guides, and the other one spent a lot of time on the lake. Did they have and, life jackets uh, on? <clears throat> they had life jackets in the boat. None of them had a life jacket on. The life jackets were in the boat. And um, and then to make things even worse, this was October. The water was 50 degrees. And um, uh, they were fully outfitted like they were ice fishing. So 
And uh, we're guessing alcohol was probably a factor on some level, or we don't know that either, so we shouldn't say. I mean, they, they left one bar, but I mean, it's tough to say whether that was a factor in the accident. Uh, I don't think they were overserved by okay. any means. But. Okay. So, like, let's, I, I didn't mean to present that as, like, yeah. let's, that, that's not a factor. We've already got cumulative effects going on here. We have nighttime boat driving, okay, which Joe, you can see Joe's terrified of it because for yeah. good reason, there's lots of examples. He's not yeah. just. You know what? A lot of these things are what you're passing on to other people. I have full confidence in Joe driving at night. Joe's trying to pass on to the people watching this. You have less boating experience than he does. Don't think that it's okay. Even him being growing up on the lake is super cautious of it. Even these guides that never made it to their destination, who had so much experience on the lake, lived on the lake, didn't have enough experience. Okay, so cumulative effects. Driving at night. No life jackets. We're not going to say alcohol was involved because we don't know. But there's just so much bad stuff going on already. Yeah. Yeah. You're absolutely right. It's, it's just, you know, that I think people definitely take uh, boats and traveling in boats lightly and especially traveling at night lightly. It's You don't have brakes. You don't have lights. You don't have headlights. I mean, it's you think you're by yourself out there and you're not. So... Uh, I know I know that you can catch fish at night. I know that you can go out there and catch fish at night. But th I really, truly think that it is not better than day fishing on Lake of the Woods. On the northwest angle portion of Lake of the Woods is where I have the most experience. I don't think it's worth it to go out there at night. Okay. Gotcha. Let's uh... – Hold on one second. I'm having a lot of trouble finding where we were on these questions. But I remember the guy was like, Appel was his last name. I'm never going to find it. But all I wanted to say about that, just to, to, to put one like, last little thing on it, because he said full moon at night was his point, right? Yeah. I know an extremely credible guide, and I'm not going to mention his name because I don't want to like pit you know, one guy's opinion versus another, especially if he's not the one presenting it. But he is adamant that a full moon at night scares muskies. And this is a very, very credible muskie guide. And he, in his opinion, full moon at night spooks muskies. Okay? So I'm not saying he's right. You're definitely wrong. What I'm suggesting is there's a lot of opinions out there. So, I mean, I take them all. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Nothing's that obvious. Okay. Joe, let's hammer these with one sentence answers and try and get through a bunch of them. I don't okay. know if right. anymore. Um, it's getting late. I tend to ramble when it gets late. Okay, a couple people have suggested trying Manaki in and around the bridge. Okay, we were talking about fishing around dams. Bridges are the same thing. Bridges are always built in the narrowest part of a river, which is going to be a concentration point of current and a fish activity. So that's going to be a good place in Manaki to try and catch a muskie from shore. And I know that muskies do get caught in boats near the bridge, so... Um, show me the coot. Okay, we must be old because we did see the coot. Go get that coot. Okay, we got the coot. You're welcome, everybody. We got the coot. Uh, Aaron circles the parking lot three times to find a close spot. Is that some sort of a, a joke? Do you know what that means? Br Brandon McCracken says, Aaron circles the parking lot three times to find a close spot. It's saying... We, does it mean we're not, like, getting to the point directly? Or does it just mean he's that, like, old lady that's lazy and drives around the parking lot looking for a, an open spot? Oh, because you want to be, like, right up next to the door. So, is, okay, so is it a huge word picture that Brendan's creating? Brandon, sorry, Brandon's creating? Or, man, that's a just, doozy. I'd say just move on. Um, da, 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 da. That dude looks like Borat. I don't know which one of us he means. <laughs> I think he does. The one with the real mustache. Brandon with another crack, okay? Listen to this. His, his last name is McCracken. Here's a Brandon McCracken with another crack. See if we can dissect this one. Brandon says, Aaron calls in lemonade stairs because they don't have permits. Calls in lemonade stairs because they don't have permits? Stands. Lemonade stands? Lemonade no, stands. maybe he stands. See, Brandon... Is. This is, like, don't screw around with grammar, guys. Like, reread your post before you type them. Were you in that much of a rush? If you screwed this up, and he did, you're right, Joe. Good, good job for picking it up. So, he's, lesson learned. Grammar matters. Brandon says that Aaron calls in lemonade stands because they don't have permits. Okay, so this guy's got some good jokes going here. This guy says, 
Bring back 49 hours, please. Oh, right. Another typo. Yeah. Uh, uh, Joe, move the bait slow to show us. So these are a little bit old. Oh, they they still are on the coot thing. Huh? No, I think it's an outdated comment. Talk while you show it so that it takes you in the screen. Oh, hey. Hey, guys. Here's the coot. Here it is. Here's the... Uh, how it's built it's got a through wire look at that right has to be through crazy. wire right? it has just... to... it's like ridiculous people just laugh and they don't think that it catches muskies and it's got a big profile and uh it's like nothing else out there yeah like, what... You know what Channel Camp 204 Channel Cat Champ 204 says to you? He says the coot bait is for people who can't throw bucktails without getting snagged every other cast. <laughs> oh my gosh. He's probably kind of right on that. Except for it's even harder than throwing a bucktail. Because it's like a kite. It's like throwing a sheet of plywood. But you don't get snagged because it floats. Yeah. Kid Riggler wants to know if I'm coming to an event in Woodlands. I, I probably am not. I don't know anything about it. And the more events I go to, even less videos you get. So instead of getting like two videos a year, you'll get like one or no videos a year. Um, Brett Thomas says, today's angler sighting. Is today's angler Lee Token's show? Yes. Yes. So that's, yeah, we got a yeah a big shout out there from the mention of, uh, what's that bait called? Woodchopper? Uh, the boiler, boiler maker. Boiler maker. Woodchopper might be another one of his baits, right? Something like that, I think. I can't remember. He makes some good stuff. I like that Boilermaker, especially. Um, Aaron Shears for both teams. Oh, here's another. Here, here's Brandon McCracken again. Aaron Shears for both teams when watching sports because he wants to be fair. <laughs> I feel like these are those Drake jokes that make fun of how soft Drake is. <laughs> <laughs> He's pretty spot on, though. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty, yeah, pretty good. But the, the parking lot ones really stumped us, didn't it? I don't know. I think he's talking about maybe we're not getting to the point quick enough or something. No, none of these have like meaning to what we're talking about. Aaron shoots for both teams when watching sports because he wants it to be fair. <laughs> uh, Ryan McIntyre, McIntyre, I bet you I nailed it, McIntyre. This is the Ryan Marlowe fan. He says, bucktails are for anglers that can't work a crankbait. Ooh, I do love working crankbaits. Oh, so you break the mold. I love a crankbait. I've had, I've had bucktail guys tell me that I throw crankbaits when they would never even think about throwing a crankbait. You hear that, Ooh. right? Uh, Brandon McCracken again. Aaron reports swearing in YouTube videos. <laughs> Oh my gosh, you're egging them on now. Somebody else said 49 hours. Uh, we're not going to talk about Easter egg anymore. Coot looks like Mickey Mouse. Uh, fish rivers from shore. Okay, we got that advice again. Uh, fish the Norman Dam. Okay, bring back 49 hours. Okay. Minaki from shore. We got that again. Fish from shore. Minaki from shore. Duluth. No, what does it say? Trout fishing. No, we're not going to talk about trout fishing, Vin. Uh, Brandon McCracken, Aaron leaves the lights on when he leaves a room. I feel like this might be my dad posting. Uh, another damn mention. It's, it's funny because they're answering the question the same way we did. The comments are saying fish the base of dams. Rum. You've got some knowledgeable uh, subscribers. Rum River. St. Croix and Rum River both have muskies, guys. Uh, Saint, the Thames River around Lake, Lake St. Clair, St. Croix again, Crow River, Rum River, Wisconsin River, use Google Maps to find spots, Mississippi and St. Cloud, Mississippi. Um, Travis Cook says, any advice on heavily pressured muskies? Do you want to tackle that in one sentence or two? Wait, sorry. Come back again. My air conditioner quit. I was just investigating. You're not going to believe this. Brandon McCracken has asked a legitimate question after all the cracks. He says, what are some decent fishing lakes around Duluth? After all the chirps, 
Now he circles back and wants no decent fishing lakes around Duluth. <laughs> Man. Tell him Nunya Lake. Yeah, Nunya business. Uh, I, Brandon, I would help you if I knew anything about Duluth. Um, um, uh, Island Lake has muskies in it. No. Is that near Duluth? Yeah, Island yeah. Lake. My grandma lives on it. It's right near Duluth. Look up that. And also, Duluth is on the tip of Superior, right? Uh, yes. Look up Superior Angling on YouTube. It's a uh, it's a TV show that all the shows go on YouTube. I'm forgetting the the host name right now, but I shouldn't be. Um, he used to be on In Depth Outdoors. He's, he's pretty solid. That catches a lot of big fish. Oh, it's, Pat McSherry? Nope. It's called Superior Angling, and it's all about Lake Superior. Like, I would say that three-quarters of the show are Lake Superior and right around there. So if you are also looking around Duluth, you're watching this, check out Superior Angling, and there's going to be a lot of, uh, you know, base there. Somebody says Nick Linder's in the house. Shout out. Um, Okeechobee Lake or something. Okay, here's an interesting question, Joe. They, B. Doper says, have you ever had a muskie die on you? Have I ever had a muskie die on me? Yes. And how many ever? And what did you do with them? And I had one. I've had one muskie that I know for a fact died on me. It was small. It was uh, we were vertically jigging with bondy baits over some fairly deep water, and uh, the fish the fish took the bait deep right to the gills in about twenty feet of water. And, um, you know, I fought it, fought it in the gills all the way to the surface and I beat him up bad and I unhooked it and put it back in the water and it was not much after that. I mean, it pretty much went belly up and, you know, it kind of made a kick towards the depths. It didn't look good. I pulled up the trolling motor and got out of there before it came back up. That's, that's all I can say. I can say I've handled a lot of muskies, and that's the only one that I know for a fact died. There is, you know, you never know about some of them. There's yeah. some that's released slower than others. I think they were fine. Maybe they weren't, but there's one for a fact I know died. So, so it's the only one. It's the only one. I can like, 100% honest there. Like Joe said, you don't want – to be there to deal with it and most of the time it's not because of you me joe everybody watching here really cares about fishing chances are it's the people you're fishing with you don't want to like put that experience on them necessarily because it's they can't really necessarily handle it and you want to make sure you nurture them in fishing because they're like less experienced than you so so like the guys we're talking about earlier if you get the fish you think it's stressed you see it's hooked badly taking the hooks out takes longer it needs to Take the fastest picture you ever imagined taking. You don't need a perfect picture because you'd rather have one bad picture or maybe no picture, depending on the situation, than have to deal with a dead body. Like, you know, yeah, it's a bit not as bad as a human dead body, but it's still bad. Like, you don't want to deal with that. So no. they do die sometimes. That's just a reality of it. It's not like if you I mean, if you handle enough muskies, it's going to happen. Yeah. And it, don't feel too bad, guys, because, like, we're the top predator. Like, the planet is ours, right? And that doesn't mean that we don't respect nature, but we are outdoorsmen. So let's not get too sad. Let's not let it shake us up too much. Let's respect nature. Let's do our absolute best to preserve it and, res you know, I was going to yeah. say respect the game, but I shouldn't go there twice in one sentence. Yeah, no, it's, um, you know... I feel remorse when it happens, but uh, it's yeah. I mean, you're putting you're putting big hooks in a fish's mouth, so so do your best. Rex Lapka wants to know, Joe, in as brief of an answer as possible. What percentage of time of the what percentage of time do you troll, and what percentage of the time do you cast? And is it based on season or time of day? So percentage to east casting or trolling, and is your consideration Time of day, or is it season? I'm probably 90% casting, and it is because of the season. Um, I cast all summer long, and as soon as the water temps drop and the fish spread out and move deeper, I start trolling in the fall. Um, 
Trevor Frey, shout out, says uh, the Rusty has destroyed lots of great cabbage. Okay, so he's confirming that a lot of his musky spots have also uh, been decimated. And then, suppose, like, you have to assume that the muskies aren't hanging out there anymore, he's saying. Uh, do, 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 do. Lots of good lakes around Duluth. You shouldn't keep musky because of replica mount. You want to talk about Guggen Squad? Vin D wants to know if we want to talk about, or he wants us to talk about, but I don't know if we want to, like, do we want, like, we can do a full video on that sometime. I don't know if we want to talk about that right now. We're talking about musky. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Guggen Squad is Guggen's. Guggen's. What about, he wants to know specifically Alex Perrick. He wants to know my opinion, but what, uh, specifically Alex Perrick, because you met Alex. Alex came to the angle. Did you meet him when he was there? Yeah, just briefly. He was at Jerry's getting ready to head out uh, <clears throat> for his camping trip when he was up here. Yeah, I mean, it's whatever. Uh, people, uh, it's always good to see people excited about muskies. I think he makes some good videos. I think that, uh, you know, there's maybe a difference between people who are making a video log of what they're doing and of people who are putting up a few uh, videos that are of fishing trips or something like that. I don't know how to explain it. But how bad is this video in comparison to the worst video imaginable? How bad is this one? Well, I'm surprised that there's quite a few comments coming in, to be honest. I don't know. I figured once everybody else left and it was just me and you, it was really going to be just me and you. And like uh, maybe Pete Corky or something. But... <laughs> what I find cool about uh, Alex and how we would view Alex, how we would interact with Alex, Alex's role in the fishing industry, is it's going back to talking about Joe going on fishing trips with anglers of all ages where the age doesn't really matter anymore. Like I don't view Alex as a kid, even though I think he's probably 10 years old, 10 years younger than me. Like Joe and I are only a few years apart, maybe, but mm -hmm. Alex significantly younger, but I don't even think about his age. And that's the cool part about fishing again is, is I look at everything he does as being a different uh, genre of video as me, but not like, Oh, He's, he's a kid, and that's what he's doing. It's like, okay, he's a peer. You know, we're all fishermen, and we, like me, Joe, Alex, all work in the fishing world, so we're all peers in that sense. But the age isn't a, isn't a thing. So that's one thing I will comment that I think is cool about my opinion of Alex, even though I don't have too many opinions because I have uh, not met him yet. No. So uh, he thinks that you don't like him. I watched that on one of his videos one time. Oh, okay. So maybe you should text him and clear that up. I certainly will this evening, in fact, once this video is done. Um, I, I definitely don't specifically have an issue with Alex. Definitely not one I can think of, which means I don't have an issue with him. Um, and there is a perception. We weren't going to get into this topic. There's a perception because some of my strongest viewers have made it divisive, have made it Uncut Angling versus Guggen Squad. And over on the Guggen Squad side of things, they don't even know about Uncut Angling because the, the, the Guggen Squad is is huge now, right? Like we're talking about six or 700,000 subscribers compared John to- B, John B is at almost like 850 now. It's just John crazy. B is almost at a million subscribers. And to just, here's what you need to understand about that. John B or all of these guys are like, their scale to say somebody like, let's just compare them to- I can't use Justin Bieber as an example, but like a celebrity not far under Justin Bieber is only like five times bigger. Like, you know what I mean? Like some of these rappers, oh, yeah. I want to, I'm going to Google it right now for perspective, but I, I'm going to say Kanye West. Is that a good example or is he going to be too big? He might be a little too big. <laughs> Kanye West. Okay. No, here's his, here's his channel. So my point is I want to see how many subscribers Kanye West has. Get this. Kanye West has 4 million subscribers, okay? And, and the, the weight of that situation is that John B has only like four times less subscribers. As in Kanye is only four times bigger than John B. He has 25% of the followers. That's yes. unbelievable. That is epic. Like, there is yeah. like, such a crazy scale. So if there was any perceived rift, it's funny because my fans are like, oh, you know, like, like – Uncut Angling versus Guggen Squad, which there isn't really that there, and especially because if there, there is if the rift is unknown on the other side, then it's definitely an unknown rift. And I've uh, I have met John. We did some videos together, as everybody knows, and it was a good time. And uh, perceivably, we will do it again someday. There's no I is, do, I text is Uncut Angling versus Guggen Squad like J Cole versus Little Pump. 
I've never even heard of Little Pump, so it's hard to compare them. Oh, from- wow. So that's exactly what it is then. Okay. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh no. I'm Little Pump. No, you're J. Cole. You're J. Cole. Are you sure? Yeah, you're J. Cole. And then, right. like, the I young see. guys, the new generation that we don't understand, that's Little Pump. We're like, we don't like that music. They don't even sing about anything. And then they're like, well, we don't need to sing about anything. We just like the beat. And we're like, whatever, you know? Um, I feel like if people were still commenting, maybe they would agree with me on that. But there's tons of comments. I can't, like, read them all. I can't believe. That's crazy. Yo, do you troll at all? At, the, at this time of year, will you troll at all? Do you have any to say things? No, like I don't. I know people that do. I know people that do. Uh, some trolling early season, but I do not myself. Okay, and it's less exciting, Monster Hunter. So I mean, sort of less less exciting. So the, the when I would consider it is if I have like a, an older person or a kid in my boat, and I want to keep the lines in the water. Otherwise, like let's cast, like let's have more yeah. of the movement. Let's have some action right in front of us. And Joe can put together his plan and how he wants to go back on the fish if he knows where fish are from follows. You don't get the follows when you're trolling. Yeah. Um. Miss Princess Paulina suggests another place, uh, Fish Lake Calhoun in Minneapolis for muskies from shore. Uh, somebody else agrees. Calhoun is actually really good from shore. Here we go. It's all like rolling in. I think you can catch crappies from shore on Calhoun. Have you heard of Calhoun? Spring. Yeah, I have. Probably in like a rap song or something. Man, there's like so many comments, but okay, here. Okay, I don't want to talk about that. Have you fished Eagle Lake, Joe? Yeah, just a few times late fall, like uh, Halloween time. Um, and like, do you need to go fish it again? Like, how does it compare? Uh, I've only seen like five muskies caught there, and three of them were over 50 inches. So I plan on going back. Okay, cool. And here's what I would say, just from a little bit I know, is I would say that Lake of the Woods, okay, where all these guys are fishing tomorrow, is potentially the best lake in the world for musky fishing size and numbers. Is that accurate? Like, can I, can I say that in the world? Is that accurate? I think so. What? I'm supposed to say more than that? Oh, yeah, we want these. Oh, yeah. back. But it's also, yeah, like, yeah. you know, the lake with the most shoreline, the lake with the most islands, the lake with the most access points, the lake with the most outfitters, the most the lake with the most different types of basins and different water colors and systems and dynamics and rivers. It is the most complicated lake with muskies that we have. So that makes it pretty cool. And we're, you know, going to give it a shout out because it's so iconic and everybody here guides there and stuff. So it's, you know, if it's the best lake for numbers and size, then that's very noteworthy. Uh, Trevor phrase the combination of numbers and size. There's better places to go for just numbers. There's better places to go maybe for just size, but the combination of numbers and size. Yeah. Trevor phrase says five times catching the same musky in six years. I was actually, I have saved on my phone here. Do you know who Trevor phrase is? Could he be one of the guys that caught your same fish and, and was in that situation? Oh no, right here, right here. This is, this is, he could be talking about it. Okay. Okay. This is just a quick post. This is a post on a forum um, that is kept up by some guys who fish on Lake of the Woods. And uh, a friend and top notch fisherman recently informed me about a very unique feature. Last Saturday, he caught a fish in a narrow current channel that measured 48 and three quarters inches. Well, he also had caught the same fish in 2010 when she measured 49 and a quarter. Again, nice, and perhaps not that unusual, right? Turns out he caught her twice in July of 2012, two days apart, and she measured 50. Now, I suspect everyone would agree we're getting, getting a bit unusual. Not really when you consider he also caught her in August 2013 when she was still 50. Five times over six years in a 100-yard stretch of water. Where's that story? Muskie under? This is on a forum, uh, Outdoors 911. So, obviously, Trevor Fraze read the same story, or he's referencing his own opinion because you guys have the same numbers? He could be, he could be uh, referencing the same story. That was a post by Dick Pearson. 
Oh yeah, I think uh, Trevor Fraze follows him because Dick Pearson, like Dick Pearson, still fishes in the angle a bit, doesn't he? He does a, a bit, yep. Yeah. Store maybe. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I think he does sort of like that. Must be the same story. Must be. But, but we already did the math, and it can be up to twenty-five. Is what we decided. Twenty-five. Yeah. Uh, somebody says Lake of the Woods by a large margin over Laxwell in terms of numbers, but size is a different story. And we're talking about the combination. Yes. Man, I... Oh, here's a good one. Brandon McCracken. I want to just, like, filter out the Brandon McCracken comments. He says, Aaron wears his life jacket in the car. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh, Johnny Lack says, two years ago, nearly hit a boat that lost all electrical and they were dead in the water. Saw the silhouette against town lights. Yeah. Okay. See? If it happens to you, get your headlamp on, find some way to turn a light on. Like, do yeah. whatever you can. Make yourself known or go to shore where you're not going to get hit. That's why that, and that's why you have a paddle in the boat, always. I mean, at least it gets you, at least with a paddle, you can get out of the main route. You can get away from where everybody's driving, and you might be dead in the water, but you're not going to be in the in a path, you know. So. Well, another thing is, is you've got to have everyone knows this. You've got to have matches or a lighter, like in the boat or on you or whatever. So go to shore, and you're, you're thinking, oh, now I'm on shore for the rest of the night. No, make a fire. You'll get found with a fire quicker yeah. than absolutely anything. Yeah. The first boat that comes by is going to stop if you're making a fire in a weird spot and and ask you what's up and then help you out. Mm -hmm. Um. And just to relay a personal story, I one time stopped my boat in the middle of like a, not a busy channel, but in the middle, like it was Corkscrew Channel, if, if, if you guys know where that is. I stopped my boat in the middle of Corkscrew Channel in the middle of the night on a night where I had made a very long boat ride. I hadn't seen a single other boat. And I turned off my lights to watch the Northern Lights, okay? And however the wind direction was, I didn't hear anything. And I was there for, say, Let's call it five minutes. Don't know exactly. A boat whizzed right past me, like 30 feet past me. And uh, and they turned around and were yelling at me, like, what the heck's your problem? And it was a very awkward moment because of how stupid I felt. So just to put in perspective, I mean, Joe's saying don't even be out there. And here I am out there as an idiot, like with my lights off, watching the northern lights for a few minutes. And because of the wind direction, I didn't hear the boat coming. The wind's coming right on at me. I didn't hear the boat coming. He can't see me. It's just sketchy. Like, you, you, I know, I know situations that I have been in where there was boats anchored in a bay, and it was dark out, and I was returning to a resort in the bay, and the way that the lights were on shore, all of the lights on shore, um, made it so that I could not, I couldn't see the lights of the boat that was anchored in the bay, and, uh, um, I, you know. Uh, if luckily I noticed him, but uh, it, very easily, if I wouldn't have known that he was there, very easily could have just totally missed him and hit him because it. I mean, he had lights on and everything, but if I just, you know, if I wasn't standing up, if I was sitting in the chair drinking a beer or something like a lot of people do, there's a good chance I wouldn't have seen him, and he was right in my path, you know. So alcohol and boating do not mix. Okay, yeah. especially younger viewers, you need to realize that from a young age. And it doesn't matter if your role models are doing it; just you got to nip it in the butt. It doesn't. It's it's uh, it is it's pretty crazy how accepted it is. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a lot of people that are out there in their boats with alcohol, and uh, man, it's 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 wild. I mean, it's easy to make mistakes. Guys, it's cool to be safe. That's what's cool. It's cool to take a stand and be safe. When I told that story earlier about Paul Castellano, like putting his foot down and being like. No, we're not taking a picture of that muskie. That's what's cool. Like taking a stand, making yourself known, not blending in and being like, oh, everybody else is drinking beer. I guess I'll have one too. Like you don't need to fit in anymore. It's not school anymore. Okay. Like you shouldn't be striving to fit in. You should be striving to do what's right, do what's safe. Aaron, man, <clears throat> I really want to keep doing this because this is awesome. Yo, let me be honest with you. We have like maybe 340 comments to get through and then we're going to go to bed. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. We're going to shut her down. I'm going to do a, a quick <laughs> scroll through and I'm going to ask Joe one more question. Hopefully it's a good one. There's a lot of Trump comments here, which like guys, they we're all about what? 
fishing and things that pertain to fishing. Like, we're not anti-Trump. Like, I mean, do you are, in, how, how are they even tying Trump to comments into anything? They're just, it's all this go Trump stuff. Like, and then if I say something about Trump ever, people are like, you're anti-Trump. And I'm like, I, I don't think I am. I don't think I really know anything about politics or anything other than fishing. Yeah, like, I don't know about any of that stuff either, but I just think that's kind of weird. Okay, Alex Perrick, I doubt this is actually Alex Perrick. Aaron, what's your view on Canada legalizing marijuana? <laughs> Again, like, don't really care. Not fishing related. Um, I, I hope that they would, uh, I don't know. Who cares what my opinion is? It's great for musky anglers. Yeah, it's great. Like, musky anglers are known, and I'm certainly not saying all musky anglers, but a lot of musky anglers are known to partake in smoking marijuana. I would say that guides are on a higher level, so not guides on the average necessarily. Um I don't smoke marijuana myself, but uh, I know people that do. I just hope that when they like go to the process of legalizing it, that they like have everything figured out. Like, how are they going to enforce it with driving? With like, I don't know. Is it going to be that much easier for kids to get it when they're twelve now instead of fourteen? Does that even matter? I don't know. I like it. Just like be like. I hope that the government has a plan in place because it's. You know, it's it's not everything's better if everyone can get guns as easily as possible and drugs and alcohol. Like that's not some restriction from government is not the end of the world. Like we make bad decisions if we're left to be too free. Like the internet, for example, we have everything at our fingertips. Okay, like that's too much freedom. And I'm not just talking about like the dark corners of the internet with the really scary stuff. I'm just talking about having Facebook and Instagram and all those things at your fingertips. We can't handle that responsibility. Like we can't shut off our devices and go to bed. Look at us on here right now. Like we need to have more self-control. And as humans, we can't handle it. It's too much power in our grasp. Like you don't find yourself on your phone more than you should be in, in general. Yeah. You want, to right, you want me to keep going? No, nope. no, nope. we're good. Okay. Thanks everybody for your comments. Sorry, we could not. Thank you, thank you, Aaron, for having me, and thanks everybody for listening to what I have to say. I really appreciate it. This was a lot of fun, and uh, we should do do this again sometime. We definitely will. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, everybody, for paying attention. And I will put all the contact information for everybody that participated in the description. You can certainly go book a trip with anybody out on Lake of the Woods or in uh, Luke's home lake in Vermilion, in Minnesota. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Good night.